OK, good morning, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Thursday, the first day of June in the year 2023. This is a budget hearing for the Department of Finance with the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 1030 AM start. The clock on my cell phone is showing 1045 AM. May we have a roll call for the commencement of this budget hearing? And I see Councilperson Prinzeri. Here. Councilperson Baggiano. Councilperson Solomon. And Council President Waterman. Here. We have four council members in attendance at 1045 AM. In addition, at its time of its preparation, the notice of this meeting was disseminated Friday, May 26, 2023 at 310 PM to the Mayor, Municipal Council, Business Administrative Corporation Council, and the local newspapers, so I can certify as to our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. I'm going to turn it over to uh, the council person who's chairing this meeting, and that's Council Person Prince Airy. Thank you, Sean. Good morning, everyone. Um, Director Gondula, do you want to get started? Yep. Okay. Good morning. Rachel, am I a little too loud? Good. You can hear me. So, good morning. My name is Carmen Gondula. I'm the Director of Finance for the City of Jersey City. Here with me today are um, some staff from the Department of Finance. Um, in addition, I have our Budget and financial management consultants, um, Matt and Steve Wilcox, the Wilcox Company, are here to um, my right. Uh, I have. If anybody has their cell phones on, if we can silence them, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that from the beginning. Thank you. Sorry about that, Cone. I have uh, Director Graves, the Director of um, Office of Management and Budget. I also have with me Raquel Tasada, who is our QPA. Director of our Purchasing Division, and I have our um, Acting Chief Financial Officer, also ABA for the city that we all know who needs no introduction. This is Mr. John Mercer. <laughs> so, um, Council Members, um, I provided a folder with you um, for today with you. Um, I'm going to go through the agenda and I'm going to go through the deck. There's two presentations today. There is the presentation on the Department of Finance. And then there is the presentation on the city's financials, budgets, um, so on and so forth. So I'm going to ask, God bless you, Councilwoman, um, that you pull up the, the first presentation of the Department of Finance. I'm going to go through those details first. And then Kyle Graves is going to go and make the presentation for the budget. So as you know, the Department of Finance, um, our roles and responsibilities are to safeguard the city's financial integrity through develop, uh, having developmental strategies and sound fiscal policies. The department is comprised of six divisions, which is OMB, Treasury and Debt Management, Accounts and Control, um, Procurement and Purchasing, Grant Administration, and um, my office. You know, overall, we are in, um, responsible for investing. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it keeps going in and out, sorry. Um, you know, we're responsible for building and collecting funds, investing in the, and managing the city's cash, accounting and reporting for all funds, and managing the city's debt portfolio and capital planning processes. On the next page of my presentation, you'll see that our current organizational structure that makes up of all, of all of the teams in finance. The following page kind of sort of talks about the department to overview and things that I've been focusing on and working on um, in managing the department. So this is kind of sort of the snapshot of managing functional performance, managing the finance IT portfolios, closing the books, complying with regulations, and this is kind of sort of the process map that works within our department. Um, our departmental goals and visions. So last year, um, my management team spent six months in a training, professional tra training and development plan. And what you see on this page, on the sixth page, is what are what is my staff prioritize? What does the department prioritize? And we're prioritizing um, us doing a high quality job. We want to help each other succeed. We want to make steady progress and growth towards our goals. They want to be experts in the topics. And they want to be producing concrete results and taking on new challenges and solving problems. On. Page seven, you'll see. 
the accomplishments and we're going to the accomplishments within the department. And so in 2022, we did a reorganization of, of the department and divisions. Uh, we had standardizations of like our finance department meetings. Um, like as I said, we enrolled our leadership staff in a personal training and uh, development course. We established the frameworks for the grants division, began the demonstrations for the financial management software, um, and we start, started to work to reduce audit findings and the capital plan developments. My goals for this year, 2023, is to work on policies, operations, and procedures. And in your full, in your packets, you will see actual um, work product that the department has um, worked on. And in your folders, you'll see the grants policy and procedures manual. You'll see the purchasing manual as well. That kind of serves giving the guide books and the road mapping to the structure to the department. So we're really focusing on um, operations. We're really focused on, on getting back to the fundamentals. There are definitely policy initiatives that I do want to work on. And in your packets, um, you'll see that there is a presentation on from the National Finance um, Association's committee on assessments, revenue, losses, and things of that nature. And so these are just kind of sort of like high level overview departmental objectives of what we're working on, what you'll be seeing uh, throughout the rest of the year. Next page, we'll go through some of the accomplishments. Um, in 2022, the Office of Management Budget um, reestablished the city's fund balance. He established a stricter internal controls in, for the procurement. We established and sent four department division member staff to the CMFO um, courses. And we did a voluntary buyout and were able to fix, um, reduce city salaries by 800,000. Um, and again, we'll go through like high level kind of sort of by by area, but you'll see the division of collections. You know, the tax sector's been working really hard on um, collecting, transferring funds. You'll see items notated here, you know, $4.5 million, different things in accounts and controls, enrolling staff in the different courses, um, working on different staff development and planning and participating in different policy kind of sort of frameworks as it relates to um, challenge grants and so on and so forth. Any questions at this point? No? Okay. Um, and again, on page 11, you'll see um, what OMB did, what the division collections did, accounts control, um, what their goals are by area and really working on establishing month end and year end closing procedures, promoting staff into leadership development. Um, my actual tax collector who isn't here today is actually at a conference this week because she's now on the board of the New Jersey Tax um, Association um, in New Jersey, which is I think going to be a great benefit and resourcing bringing back um, to, to the department. Um, and then Treasury Debt Management, they're working with an accounts control to help reduce audit findings and um, introduce and improving collaboration with colleagues, training and maintaining outside of um, more collections. And you've seen the office here present in um, their areas as well. And then lastly, um, departmental goals by area with purchasing. Um, Raquel's worked really hard uh, this year in getting back to the basics. Um, her goal is to you know, be able to accept e-signatures on bids and accept online um, it's online, distributing drawings and plans. Um, she worked, we're still working with the policy initiative with Harvard on procurement reform. Later this year, you will see a community vista, uh, community financial vista, that's going to help um, engage with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and purchasing and tying some of those things. So we're really excited about that, that we're still working on those kind of sort of policy initiatives. And so we're hoping to get um, an answer back. Um, hopefully next month with, with the VISTA program as the last update um, that we got. And then with the grant administration team, in your folder, you will see um, a policy and procedures manager that's ready to go. You'll see a dashboard that we've created so that departments can understand their grant funding status and balances. Um, as we all know, right, the city received a lot of federal funding, right, through CARES Act and ARPA. Um, our overall goals 
or what's budgeted for this year is 34 million that we've identified for this year um, in our grants portfolio, but we do realize that that's you know a little bit short. The city needs more, and so um, as I go through my departmental request and its budget changes, I'm going to ask that we you know um, focus a little bit on that area and how do we beef up that area um, as um, as a priority um, for the for the department. We'll now go through um, the budget requests and its changes from our department. And um, if you guys all have your um, handouts as it relates to, uh, to the budget. So what you'll see here in our departmental budget is um, the organizational chart of what's being proposed. So I started my presentation stating that I had six divisions. In reviewing the department and assessing and going through a lot of like the internal controls and management, I'm looking to reorganize the department and consolidate some areas. And so what I'm asking to do is actually establish the office of the CFO. Uh, and you'll see through some of the, those details and, and my uh, road mapping process, I will say that it currently lives in our ordinance and structure. It's just not consolidated in an area by, um, by areas and teams. So I'll start with my my department. So currently I'm a department head of me and my assistant. Uh, um, but I'm very grateful to have my division leadership staff to have supported me in the past like year and a half that I've been in, in the role. And so what you'll see in my org chart is you'll see that I am there's funded vacancies, there's requested positions, and there's promotional and title changes. And so I'm looking to i've already identified a candidate i'm just waiting for the um an internal candidate from the city just waiting on the candidate to to accept the offer but ultimately we're looking to have a financial and data reporting um, assistant to me um we kyle graciously accepted to be the assistant finance director to the department and so he'll be moving on from omb and working directly close with me in um in in his leadership progression. Um, we're going to be looking to move Dennis uh, McIntosh into the director's office, but um, currently Dennis works in treasury and debt management and he leads up like managing capital and, and the budget. And so right now, since it sits in treasury, it sits in its own division, oftentimes I am working with you, the mayor's office on these specific things. And so I'm looking to move capital planning and debt planning into directly into my office managing the director's reports. Um, and then two not funded positions and that I would ask the council to look into reconsider for this year is resiliency and revenue management planning and a position for compliance and regulations. Yep. Oftentimes in the efforts of doing financial management, many People don't know the rules and regulations, and there are a lot of rules and regulations that we have to govern and go through. And so I am asking for those positions that did not make it kind of sort into our budget. Um, the next slide just kind of sort of talks about what I just said in regards to why and what we're looking to do. And for the division of collections, um, Trish Greco is the director. Again, what you'll see here is uh, funded vacancies, requested positions, promotional and title change by org structure. And so we are looking to promote and um, three staff um, within the department. And you'll see here what the requested are. And so Trish has been really working a lot in focusing on, you know, and building up her teams. And so you'll see the requested um, positions there. Next page with the purchasing. Um, Raquel, again, has done a great job in managing and leading up the efforts as it relates to the purchasing efforts and so the funded vacancies requested position is um, this year is adding in this, another assistant purchasing um, director to help manage the day-to-day -day since Raquel historically in the prior org chart was actually doing that and so that's something that you know we think that the day-to-day -day volume that we the city receives an additional person there would um, greatly help her. Um, and then, like I said before, grants administration, um, I started this team off very small and lean in regards to 
establishing it. So we've established fundamentals road mapping currently under the funded positions is um, we've identified a candidate for a grants analyst. What is not funded and what we look to fund is an, uh, another coordinator. If it were up to me, I'd probably have like six or seven people here to really beef that up. But again, uh, it, at you know the council's request to consider what we can do with grants management, fund development, um, and increasing that that portfolio. And then um, the office of the CFO. So all these positions kind of sort of work um, in their silos. And what I'm looking to do is consolidate and beef up and support Mercer in his role as our CFO and, and the day-to-day -day manager, which he's kind of sort of already doing, but it's just not written in our ordinance. So if approved through this budget, I would then come back to the council and present an ordinance on the restructuring and uh, the consolidation of the effort. And so what I'm looking to do is collapse certain divisions and make them bureaus. And so we'll have the Bureau of the Comptroller's Office, which is currently known as Accounts and Controls. Um, we're going to be consolidating some of the Treasury efforts and removing kind of sort of Treasury and debt management. Treasury will be Treasury, debt management will be in the Director's Office. And then OMB is going to be separated. The budget portion is going to come to the director's office. And then the management side, the internal controls, the day-to-day -day operations would be moved under the CFO. So the fiscal officers are reporting into that, um, into that structure. Um, you'll see on the last page kind of sort of what that road mapping looks like and where the staff would live and what we um, were currently looking to, to budget and do. So I did a, a real kind of sort of overall consolidation of efforts trying to make um, um, asks. And so where I'm asking the areas <clears throat> that are not funded in our, my budget to be con, kind of sort of considered and so on and so forth. So with that, I, I'll stop with my department presentation to talk about specifically questions about my department, the what the goals are and what we're looking to do. And then we're going to move into the most important piece, Kyle's portion of the revenue. Um, and budget piece of, um, from that. So. Let me ask a question about your director's salary. Sure. I see um, Ms. Webb, she's a director, and I see the rest of your directors. Why she's paid less? So, um, so I'm just trying to see because to the division and um, and to the other directors. Yeah. So last year when we reevaluated all the division director salaries. The ranges for division director salaries started at 90 to 100,000. Sorry, started at 100, and then it went to a range to about to 150,000. Those that are licensed individuals, like Raquel, who's a QPA, um, uh, John Mercer, who's a CMFO, uh, Trish Greco, all those licensed positions are at a different tier level in regards to the salary range. That's the kind of sort of the differential. So the grant person, what is she? She's not. She's a division director, but the division director salary range is from 100,000 to 150,000. Yeah. And then there are tiers between range one, two, three, mm -hmm. um, as it sets. So who determines? I'm just trying to understand because if she's division director, she's making 100,000, but your other division directors, they like at 116, 110. So I will say this when we design. She's the only one in grants. That's why. No, I understand. But um, I worked with HR on what is the appropriate range? What is the kind of sort of pay equity? And this is what they came back to us. So I don't think it's fair. Okay. So because if she's the only one in grants department, I, I could imagine what she's getting. The okay. work so research and everything else, and she's the lowest paid. So I, I think uh, HR need to reevaluate that. I will defer back to HR in the salary ranges for division directors problem, um, city. Uh, as well. They, they're not paying everyone correctly. So there's no need for us to keep moving on and knowing that certain employees is not being paid correctly. If they're division directors and if, especially if they're the only one in the department that's everybody's looking to for grants. I mean, well, then, you, again, I defer to human resources in regards to the salary. Yeah, I know. And the resources, they coming. I know. Andrew, okay. So I just want to note it. Got it. Uh, we gonna deal with that. I um, mean, I have a question. On page seven, you have policy. Second phase of uh, tax assessing policies and equity and fairness. An evaluation of property tax regist registry in Hudson County, New Jersey. I mean, the only ones who are being 
literally screwed are the one to four family homeowners. The big buildings are not being assessed properly. They're not uh, seeing their fair taxes. And we that own homes are suffering. And this has to stop. So, um, Councilman, um, the assessor will, will be here and he'll have his session. I think we can take the dives. But what you will see in some of the departmental goals and accomplishments were last year I chaired up an assessment review committee. And historically, our rateable values only increased a billion a year. Last year, by bringing people from the mayor's office, the BA's office, and my office, we were able to increase it uh, $3 billion. So I am fo uh, focused on this and working in tandem with um, our assessor's office. You will see in your folder, you know, a high level PowerPoint presentation that talks about assessing equity and, and to your point. And so that is a policy um, goal and idea that we'll be looking into. Something has to be done. Because yep. Totally unfair to what's going on in this city. You look around, we have financial problems. We have all this building going on and everybody knows they're not being taxed properly. But boy, the homeowners are. Please. The assessor, I think they're later yeah. today, right? He's he's coming today. Yeah. So no. we can continue that conversation then. Yeah, well. Um, any other questions for the director before she move, they move on to Kyle, the next presentation? Go ahead, Kyle. hear me there we go all right so there is a separate packet for the municipal budget in its entirety um so the budget was introduced on may 10th and this is just a summary of the revenues and appropriations uh that the council uh had approved on um, page two which is essentially the first sheet of the presentation you'll just see a, a historic look back at the last four budgets and the adopted budget amount and the employee headcount that we had budgeted for. Um, you'll see this year there's a, um, a massive drop off in the introduced budget amount. That is generally caused by the amount of grants that we receive at the time of introduction. So we do anticipate the total budget exceeding that $697 million. But as of today, that's that's where we stand. And you'll see a um, decrease in headcount. That's not necessarily all tied to separations. Um, the headcount includes budgeted vacancies. So in this year's budget review, we did ask each department for um, budget cuts. So there were some consolidation duties where we were able to reduce open vacancies that were funded last year. And then, of course, you know, the voluntary uh, separation incentive that we offered and kind of just making sure we we're the most efficient um, department in each area without necessarily contribute uh, adding more manpower where it wasn't necessarily needed. So that is um, the reasoning for that. And as we go through the department budget, you'll see where those cuts were made specifically. Uh, page three is a summary of revenues. So this is broken by category, not by line item. Um, there are individual revenue lines that we'll get into. This is an overview and you'll see the biggest change from last year really is our surplus. Um, we had zero surplus in the 2022 budget, and this year you'll see it makes up about 10% of our revenues. And the other big increase in uh, revenue is our local tax, about a 9% increase there. Um, that's not a 9% increase on the tax base, that's just the percentage of our, uh, of our revenue items. And we'll get into the taxes um, later on. But to the next sheet is uh, the first revenue category, which is surplus and fund balance. Uh, as I mentioned last year, uh, the 2022 budget had zero dollars available for surplus to support the budget. That was mainly contributed to the cash deficit, which the council is all aware of. Um, at the end of 2022, we were able to collect what was pretty much owed to the city. Um, and you'll see we ended the year with a total fund balance of 118 million and accounting uh, New Jersey accounting law only allows us to anticipate cash on hand. Um, so the original cash surplus was 20, 20, 22 million. Last week, the council approved the second reading ordinance for financing the cash deficit over five years. So what that did for us is it freed up 
increased our cash by 45 million once we do the financing and the state is going to allow us to anticipate that uh, as a revenue item in this year's budget. So our total surplus in the budget this year is 68.2 million dollars to offset some of our costs. Uh, the next page is a summary of the types of miscellaneous revenues which we'll get into. So this budget is broken down into surplus, local revenues, state aid, uh, construction code, fees and permits, grants, other special items such as pilot and abatement revenue, and um, any other type of special uh, uh, franchise agreements, um, interfunds due to the budget, uh, and items such as that, which we'll, we'll get into. Page six is a summary of Section A local revenue. So you'll see I, I sorted it from the highest anticipated amount down to the lowest. And you'll see our top few revenue items for this year are municipal court fines, 11.7, uh, parking lot tax, hotel tax, um, all the way down to driveway permits. So this is a, um, where we're looking at, at a rebound. From 2022, we did have excess revenues at the end of the year, and what that allowed us to do is anticipate um, additional revenue in this year's budget. Uh, budget only allows us to anticipate what we've collected or anything that's defined in some type of agreement. So what you'll see here in the anticipated amounts is strictly based off what we collected last year, unless there's a few items where we know we might not get to, but based on the trends from the last few years um, and pre pandemic trends, you know, we, we anticipate these these uh, revenue items to continue to grow and we're still not at 2019 levels pre pandemic, but you know, we hope to get there within the next uh, year or two. So if there's any questions on any of these specific revenue items, I will say I, um, each department will come in and if there's questions on enforcement or how they're being collected, um, I would defer to them, but I do have a general knowledge if there's any specifics or questions from the count. Sure. Um, um, two, two ones I didn't see on the list were the foreclosure fees, which we discussed last year, and the um, parklet permits. Um, right, so anything that has gone to effect this year. Sorry? That, Anything that's gone to affect this year as a revenue item or in our code, we can't anticipate in the budget until we uh, have realized that. But both, unless I'm missing something, both should have been in effect last year, right? Okay. But both of those fees, I think the parklets, you know, we, we unless I'm, unless I'm. So if they went to affect. We had a reduced fee in 2022, but I think we had a fee. Right. We do have um, the sidewalk cafe licenses. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but. So if we collect anything, they're last separate year, things unless they're being merged into the same account, but they could be. It's it's a possibility um, when those department directors we come in, we could question them to see if they're lumped in. Uh, if we collected anything last year that was new, it would have went to Myrna. Um, miscellaneous revenues not anticipated. Um, but if we need to break out these um, revenue accounts into greater detail, we could do that. So I'll, sure. I'll follow up on those two specific ones for you. So that'd be great. And then I do want to just ask a question about the surplus. Is there a way to kind of get a breakdown of how the surplus was generated? So I see the, the summary that shows cash more than liabilities, but what were the sources of the cash? So I think within our financial statement, it should provide um, in the trial balance should have a breakdown of everything. In the 2022 annual financial statement? Right. Okay. And next to that, you know, I'm just looking at the, the five year projection on the surplus. So, so it looks like we're using 68 million this year, but then only 10 million in the subsequent four years. And what's the sort of thought process on, on using so much of it now versus in future years? So first back to the breakdown. So on sheet 19 of the AFS, okay, um, you could find that. Um, it's, it's really accredited to excess revenues, appropriation reserves, and collecting uh, revenue receivables from the prior year. Um, but you'll see down sheet 19 as far as the, the forecast. I mean, I'll get into it later on, but we just wanted to be conservative uh, with our expectations because it is contingent on this year's operations. So we felt like a $10 million number would be 
a safe estimate um, considering everything else. Um, if it's greater than that, you know, if, if if we can alleviate some of the tax burden with extra surplus, you know, we'll go through that process next year. But the reason it's so great this year is because, you know, we really needed to, we wanted to limit the tax burden on residents. And that would, that helped us achieve, you know, only a 2% increase. Right. And our, our revenue is kind of limited on how we can expand. Um, we don't have any land sales this year um, and there's no changes to anything else outside of uh, outside of surplus. So that was just the mechanism to balance the budget. Yeah. I understand that. I guess my concern is just using it all this year. And, you know, would, would it, you know, if we run into a problem next year, if the economy does well, in a recession, you know, that, that it's our cash. Our plus we still have one balance of I think it was one hundred sixteen million dollars, right? Where essentially there's there will potentially be excess cash next year beyond ten million dollars. So in past budget years, we have we really ranged from twenty to forty million. It kind of fluctuated year to year. So there's a possibility it could fall between anywhere within that range. Um, again, it's contingent on this year's operations, but we don't feel like anticipating that sixty eight this year is gonna hurt us next year. Um, you know, we're tax increase where the the tax base is up, so that's gonna continue to grow with valuations. And there's a multitude of factors that are gonna, you know, alleviate our reliance on on surplus to balance the budget. It's just that that was the case this year, coming off bad 2021 and slightly better 2022. Oh. Just for a little bit of context, um, where are we from 2019 to 2023 um, when revenues? Because I know you had mentioned that we're not up to those numbers yet, but I just kind of want to get a better understanding of how far away we are. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll provide a supplemental look back on where we, uh, for the forecast, where we got the numbers from. But our local revenues are only at 47 for this year. That's what we're anticipating. Prior to 2020, we were in the 55, 60 million dollar range, and the revenues were going up. So it kind of we kind of took a few steps back um, in since 2020. Um, okay, and I, I have a couple of questions about the revenues, but I will save them for when the divisions are here in front of us. If, yeah. yeah, but as you know, in particular with municipal court. So yeah, and I would say courts. We fell a little bit short on what we anticipated for core fines last year, um, and that'd be best directed to the court director. I'll, I'll save it for them. Thank you. Yeah. You know. Hey, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go on. No, you go. Uh, no, uh, actually, you're giving us all this paperwork. There's pages and pages of paperwork. This should have been given to us a week ago, so we could have gone through it and asked questions. Well, I will, I will say all the information in this presentation is in the introduced budget. It's summarized by section um, with a little more detail, but the council did have all this information over a month, almost a month ago. We did? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so if we're done in the local revenue, I'll just flip to the next slide, which is uh, section B and C, um, state aid and construction fees. So last year, the state made a one-time appropriation to municipalities uh, municipal relief fund, which you see we're not anticipating this year. Um, the rest of the items are pretty much flat, so there's really we have no control over that. That is state calculated. Um, and then the second item is building permits, which you see we had a rebound and we're anticipating that to continue to grow as well. Next slide. Uh, section G, other special items. So in the budget document that the council voted on, there's individual pilots listed. I lumped them together here for simplicity. So last year we exceeded our anticipated pilot and abatement revenue um, by almost 8 million, but we are anticipating a drop off in that by 6.5 this year. Now, and we had 30 terminations or expired pilots. Uh, in 2023, and as you know, those pilots now start paying conventional taxes. So um, we can provide, you know, the breakdown on what they're going to be paying conventional. That is in the user-friendly budget as well. Um, if you need me to point them out specifically, I'll do that for you. Yeah, I'm sorry, you said 33-0? Yeah, 
three zero. Yep. Yeah. Um, another item on here that you'll see a, a big drop off in is FEMA reimbursements. So this isn't negatively impacting the budget because the FEMA reimbursements last year offset um, the appropriation for over expenditures. So this year we're anticipating 4.9 million in FEMA reimbursements for costs incurred in 2021-2022. This is a one-time uh, revenue item that we're going to be receiving unless there's additional findings of items that the city didn't submit for reimbursement. But to my knowledge, there's nothing else uh, pending. And the other bigger item is the MUA franchise fee, which we are collecting monthly now, and that was a big issue in 2021. Any questions on special items? I was going to say, is there um, anything not in this presentation that is being worked on in terms of additional revenue sources from the state legislature? I know they're going through their budget process, but are we doing anything to offset any potential costs down the line by getting revenue from the state that sort of hasn't been? Because I just had a conversation with the state uh, assemblywoman and just, you know, are we requesting any funding from them or? for even special projects or anywhere? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we could check with our grant director to see if there's been any coordination there with with the state, but. Or requesting any special light items in the budget uh, down in Trenton. So specifically, those wouldn't be for operations. That would lower the. I can't hear you. So, so typically those would be for capital projects and specific projects, not for operations. Okay, so they can't offset any operational costs. I mean, they wouldn't usually do that. Yeah. But like I said back in this, they gave us an extra 3 million state uh, municipal relief aid and, but they made it very clear in the local finance notice last year, it was a one-time appropriation. Um, so, I mean, we, we haven't heard anything specific from the state as far as budget relief, but. If you, I mean, if you had a conversation and things as forthcoming, it's not public yet, then you would have to take that meeting. But again, example, um, um, like you said, the capital budget, we got $4 million for the ferry service. That wasn't kind of sort of anticipated in our budget. We identified it and that came from the state, but I do know in having discussions with council and Mira, I know she wants to do like a legislative day and going down and some of the other things, but um, we'll, we can talk mm -hmm. about it further. Yeah, Good. Thank we, you. Are, we are working on local items. I will say we're, we're focused, like Carmen said, on property assessments. That is a crucial uh, piece for us. The increase in valuation last year alone, you know, yielded us 24 million in tax revenue without a tax increase. So that was a that's a big piece for municipalities. That is 50% of our, our revenue. Um, we have no land sales this year. In prior years, we were able to uh, scale them out over three years whenever the city sold the property. We haven't sold anything in the last two years, but there are some ideas that the administration is working on. Of course, that will come to council. And we've also considered the possibility of amending our franchise fee agreement with the MUA but nothing material yet to share. Um, when we do have that, we'll share it. But that is our goal before the end of the year is to, to make sure next year we're not in, this, in a spot where we're losing millions and millions of dollars uh, in revenue without a plan to replace it. Okay. Which did we say with the buyouts, the employees? I just, I'm just curious. Yep, so I'll get into in, in the okay. spending side. So we had 44 applicants. It was $2.2 million in salaries. This year we're saving 800,000 and next year there'll be another 1.5, 1.7 shaved off based off of um, who's backfilled, what we had to pay out this year because if there are any wages paid to those employees this year, it's, it's budgeted. We had to budget the incentive amount, but we will be financing the, the crew time that we pay out sick. Mm -hmm. So there is a savings this year and there'll be additional savings down the road, as long as we do a good job of not adding back mm -hmm. uh, those high high salary positions that maybe we don't need anymore. What are we doing about the 22, 24 deputy chiefs? We have a lot of deputy chiefs in this city. Um, I, I feel like 
that's a huge cost burden. Um, not that they're not worthy. You know, I just feel as though, you know, we have to we have to start tightening our, our belt. Like our, who decides essentially the promotion process, who can afford it? Like, is there oh, consultation? Yep. The municipal code does allow for a certain amount of positions um, in public safety. It does not through finance for approval. I believe that would be better directed to yeah. public safety when they okay. come in. I just, I was like, is there communication at all or anything? So outside of their budget request, not really. Okay. Just thank you. Okay. So the last revenue item, which is most important, is local purpose tax. So you'll see the change in the municipal levy amount is. $30 million this year. As I mentioned, about 24 of that came from increased valuations. And then the additional $6 million is a result of the 1.99% levy increase. Uh, based on the average assessed value, uh, each household should see about a $72 increase on their taxes for the year. Uh, that's on the municipal side. And the average valuation is 467000 do we have any information on the assessment uh, rateable base for as of October 1st, 2023? And obviously we're not formally there yet, but projections in terms of what development is happening compared to potentially what, uh, you know, properties may be reduced on appeal. Don't have a number for 2023 yet, but the assessor's projection was um, just north of a, a billion dollars. Um, so it wasn't quite the $3 billion projection that, that we saw this year. So when the assessor comes in, I think maybe we could revisit that because there are added assessments after October 1st, 2022 that we can't use for the budget this year. Right, so you, so you said this projection right now is a billion dollars for? Yeah, just about, it's, it's over a billion, but well, like I said, it wasn't two and it wasn't three. <laughs> sure. And and does that include all the added assessments that that we did add, uh, you know, subsequent to the October first, twenty twenty two deadline? I would I would assume that that'd be okay. That'd right. be my assumption. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the one thing I'm worried about, question for the assessor, but also a question for budget in terms of as you guys are doing your projections, is whether, you know, our commercial waterfront is going to start filing tax appeals. Um, and reducing their their rateable base, um, given the reduction in, in the value of, of commercial real estate. Um, and, and I don't know what the impact is going to be. I don't know how much of our rateable base is, is based on the commercial waterfront, but I'd like us to be prepped for it as, as best as possible. We do fund a reserve for tax appeals every year. It It's a minimal amount of what we can manage in the budget. Last year we did $3 million. This year we're back to the million dollar. Um, recommendation from the tax collector, but there are other mechanisms, I believe, for us to finance any major appeals that the city has to pay out. Follow up with the law department on what what that is, but it most likely be a special emergency appropriation. Yeah, I mean, it's both obviously the direct payout, but it's also prospectively looking and thinking about, okay, well, what does the 2024 budget look like? You know, we're using the surplus this year, but, you know, I, I, Without having crunched the numbers, we we don't know what we could lose. So it, it's not that to, to say that we should all have the answers now, but it is to say it should should be on top of mind that we're we're prepped for what could happen there. And um and that is one of the department goals. Right, last year was like we didn't know what we didn't know. I just know from from a perspective, right? What is our value? Um and having worked with the assessors, I think in today's presentation with the assessors' office, we're going to have to take those deep dives on how to get to the to their math. Right, they're an independent body and. To your point, Councilman, like finance, a budget document is a living and breathing document that we prepare today, but something mm -hmm. happens and those deadlines. And so I think that, um, you know, what you see here is what we got from them. Um, and and he'll be later, they'll be here later on today so that we can actually drill down on this and Kyle and I will be part of uh, those discussions. Okay, so the next slide is the levy cap calculation. So every year the municipality is limited on what we can increase our tax levy to. This is just a summary of the calculation and where we fall under that cap. We're currently $21.4 million under the levy cap. It means we can increase our levy by that amount if needed. That's not the goal and we're pretty comfortable where we're at. 
But if there are any additional amendments that have to be made, um, we do have some wiggle room, which is good to know. And I would just let the council know that when recommendations are made to add appropriations back in or increase spending in other departments, about it's about ten dollars on the average assessment for every million dollars um, on the levy. So it's just I feel like that's valuable information to know um, in case the council is considering amendments down the road. And then the last revenue slide is the forecast for 23 to 2027. We provide this to the state. They mandated that we provide this this year in accordance with the special emergency ordinance that the council approved. And quite honestly, it's just it's good practice for us because now we have targets for next year and we kind of know where we need to keep spending at if we want to sustain a at most a 2% tax increase uh, in future years. Not again, not that we're committing to that. It's just we want to show we're able to sustain our operations um, you know, for the next few years. And I'll provide the, the backup for these projections and historical data for you. Specifically on the, the 2024 projection, other special items, it, it jumps from 30 million to, to 70 million. And can you sort of briefly explain what the you know increases there? Yeah, so we're anticipating potentially additional land sales. And like I mentioned, the MUA franchise fee agreement. We were hoping to use that in this year's budget. We didn't get around to actually that materializing. So it worked out with with the extra surplus that we didn't need to do that. Probably would have delayed the budget process a little longer, but those are items that we have kind of in mind moving uh, towards the end of the year into next year that we could use to balance the budget. And yeah, I mean, actually you're going to provide the backup. Could you do that so we see sort of what what specifically is being projected in there? And then, you know, it's a small thing, but but I would imagine I know you dropped the pilots from from, you know, in, in 23 here with 90 million. I imagine they're probably going to go down each year as more. Yeah, you know, come off the books. It obviously raises the rateable base, but but at least for city revenue, it. Yeah, so it's in a decline. We're, we're working on that schedule now, actually, with one of our financial advisors. So when we get something back, you know, we'll we'll be sure to update our projections. In theory would increase our valuation projections as well. Um, that's something that we just don't have at the moment. So we just want to keep it flat, um, you know, to be safe. OK, so that being said, I'll move on to the summary of appropriations. And on the first slide is a summary of what was spent last year and what's being proposed this year. There's no major changes in how our our dollars are being allocated. Our top cost is salaries and wages, of course, health insurance and pension contributions. And we'll get in more into that detail as we go throughout the slide. Next slide is just the, the language on the limitations uh, for appropriation increases. Similar to the levy cap, we can only increase certain appropriations um, X amount. And that calculation is on the next slide. We are $13.7 million under the appropriation cap. So like I said, if we wanted to increase our levy, we can increase our appropriations um, by this amount as well, which would kind of go hand in hand. The following slide is the summary of general appropriations within cap. So that's that these all tie into that calculation on the prior sheet. It's just a breakdown of our departments and deferred charges. You'll see the, um, the public safety is our main allocation of funding uh, department wise. And like I said, all these departments will be coming in for their own presentation if you have questions. Next slide is summary of unclassified items. Our biggest increase this year is health insurance and general liability insurance. HR manages the health insurance budget, but we did see last year that we went over budget, so we had to do some appropriation transfers at the end of the year to account for that. What we did to mitigate that this year was increase the appropriation to start and increase employee contributions by 5%, which will directly offset um, any additional costs for the city. Below that is the increase in statutory expenditures, which are pension and other types of 
uh, obligations for employees. Any questions on this? Um, in terms of police and fire uh, pension system, it looks like we have been nearly seven million more, but there's not a corresponding increase for our, you know, either the, um, you know, the uh, Jersey City retirement system or the PERS system, and, and I just wondered why we had to increase so much in in police and fire, but not in the other pension funds. So the police and fire pension obligations, we get we do get that directly from the state. I assume it has to do with um, retirees and bringing on additional police and fire um, recruits. And the city estimate is from our pension board. So if you want specifics on how they got to that number, we can follow up with you. But I mean, it's been standard year over year where police and fire has increased pretty significantly and our city pension has remained moderately flat. So is there is there a breakdown of wool from the police and fire system of what caused the increase? I mean, it's 13 percent. I mean, that that is a large increase on an annual basis. I, I could follow up and get that for you. There is a breakdown for each unit, police and fire. I would have to follow up on, you know, more detail. That'd be great. And I just also want to make sure that that we're not going to get surprised for our, you know, the Jersey City retirement system and, and have to increase after we introduce the budget. Understood, we shouldn't. A, we get these numbers at the end of the year and we confirm them again, beginning of the year with the pension uh, board, so. Okay, the next slide are other appropri appropriations excluded from CAP. This is our library appropriation, which is directly offset by a revenue item that we collect through taxes. And then, like I said, reserve for tax payments and tax appeals. And there's the calculation for uh, the library. Next slide. I want to provide a summary of 2022 results. This is the capital borrowing that we did in 2022. A few council people have asked the status on where we're at with some of these projects and funding. This is it. You'll see. It was 124 million financed, and I provided the available balances as of a few weeks ago. And one of the main reasons I included this because on the next slide, what we did this year to alleviate some of the, the burden on the budget is to use those general purpose capital dollars for some of our standard budget costs but that live within the departments, mainly public works and infrastructure. So we are proposing a $500,000 down payment in this year's uh, budget. There are no plans currently to go out and borrow any money, but we just want to make sure there was a contingency in the event something came up and we needed to replenish uh, those capital funds. And below that is the breakdown of where the budget reductions were made and the corresponding capital count. Any questions? It looks like. Um... On the, I may admit that the next slide, but it look, looks like um, we have to spend about 10 million more on capital costs this year than last year, which the breakdown looks to be in almost entirely focused on interest, interest on bonds, interest on notes, capital leases, interest in uh, interest on special emergency notes. Is that, you know, do we have our, our bonds on variable interest rates and those are those interest rates increasing? Is that what's driving that increase? So we do have, I can provide the uh, the schedule, yeah. but anything that maybe we've refinanced in the last few years or any new money that the city has borrowed, yeah. interest rates were, were higher. And I'm, that is the main driver here. Um, you'll see our principal payments are, are coming down a bit, but interest rate is strictly on the market. Uh, provide you so if you remember last year we took on the software debt book right. and getting the implementation and managing that we can get you the schedule of that so you can see yeah. the differences of like the summary um uh, for that yeah it'll, it'll summarize by ordinance okay. yeah, yeah. for each one i mean that'd be great just to see which ordinances which bond issues are having the increase in interest rate and, and then i think it would speak to maybe a broader policy around I mean, if it's if it's a new bond that we issued 
okay, we have high to pay higher interest rates, but if, if this is a bond from 10 years ago and, and we chose a variable interest rate, you know, maybe as, as a policy, we can try to uh, avoid making those choices in the future. Um, By getting the depth of the software and working with that, we are working with NW to look at looking at some of the things. And if we need to do some refunding or figuring out those strategies, they are on, on top of that um, with us. Did we bond for the 311 center? Is that something or uh, did we bond for the 311 center? I feel like we. Last year we bonded for $15 million for Department of Public Safety uh, equipment and technology. Okay. That's for the new building as well, the headquarters. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. So after debt service is just a reserve for uncollected taxes. This is a mandatory appropriation that's, that we have to have in the budget in the event we do not collect 100% of our taxes. This year, the appropriation is $8 million based on the three-year average of the prior uh, fiscal years where we collected 99 and 15% of all taxes. And then the last slide is the expense forecast for the next few years. Any questions? I was going to ask something uh, regarding the schools. Did we ever get an answer as to whether or not they were raising taxes? Based on the information that we got from the tax assessor, they are increasing taxes. They are. We had anticipated no increase in the levy. I would, again, I always advise to confirm with the assessor, but from the information he shared with us, it's it's like a 13% increase for this year's levy. Okay, do we have direct communication with the school business administrator to confirm that? I know I we we coordinate directly with our tax assessor. Can our team can can we all get get just direct communication? So it's it's not a game of telephone. You guys are setting the budget. You know, it's not this like you hear directly from the tax. We have school. We have that. The, that's what's happening. I just, just want to make sure because you know. Did receive the certify their their rate and their breakdown in the amount, and it equated to thirteen percent. School. Yes. With that, I, you need to be in. That, that's not what they publicly have said, and I, I did reach out to them after we had the note from the CFO. You know, a couple hours before our meeting. They 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 did. The folks that I talked to were like, "This is not what's happening. I don't know what's going on, but like." You go, well, what we're billing is extra 13% for here. But to Councilman's point, pre COVID, we had regular meetings and conversations with the superintendent, the school sure business administrator, and some of their board members. And I, while we're trying to do our budget, we're learning that their budget is, that the levy is increasing and that affects everybody. So I think that. While this is not the conversation to have here now, we need to discuss reviving some of these meetings because we can't operate in silos. We can't pretend like the budgets don't affect each other. Right, and I mean, our, our clerk should have the certification from the school board or the county on what their levy is for the year, which, which we'll share with you. And that would bring us to, what was it, 105% or I forgot what it, uh, would they be able to continue to increase it year after year, or would we have maxed out the levy uh, at that point? The Board of Ed budget doesn't impact our levy. They don't have a cap. I know Chris Christie put one, then it got removed. And is that coming back at all or no? The, the cap, I heard it might come back 2025 or. So. All of our budgets are independent from theirs. They have their levy cap as well, but they do have those exclusions and cap bank. Um, similar to how we have our, our breakdown here. You know, we're under our levy cap. They have to be under their levy cap, but that doesn't necessarily tie them to 2%, right? It, it could be, it could exceed that as you saw last year with, you know, with the city budget. Yep. This is a shame. All right. 
can do with the school. We have to just figure out a way how we can meet with them even before they post their budget. There needs to be one tax strategy in this city. It has to be. It has to be one tax strategy. It has to be one tax. This, this is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, and what, is, what can we do from a financial perspective? Uh, is there somebody from the state we need to talk to? Because it, it need to be just one, one pretty much one area in which our taxes in, is increased because it, it will it will hurt us more so. I don't want to say kill us. It'll yeah. hurt us. <laughs> it's pretty close to death. That's what yeah. Councilman Youssef said. Yeah. I, I do Go have ahead. a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, um, so on, I just want to make sure I understand the deferred charges in the back of the budget book uh, as appropriate as possible. So um, there, there's four line items in a row, prior year bills, over expenditure of appropriations, grant expenditures without appropriations, and over expenditure of appropriation reserves that total roughly 7 million. And my understanding is those are all 2022 over expenditures, not 2021 over expenditures. Is that right? Those are a result of the 2021 audit. Only 2022 over expenditure, I believe it was $2.2 million for 2022 operations. So, 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 but there's a separate line item that says 2021 audit and then lists additional right. items. Okay. And I, I'm just reading from the, the um, audit here and it says, um, as of the date of this report, the best estimates of the city's 2022 budget over expenditures approximate 4 million. This amount is subject to change. So I, I, I just want to get that where that, you know, kind of have those what's in the audit connects into what's in our budget doc. All of our deferred charge requirements are in the budget document. So everything ties out um, 4 million. I know 2.2 is directly correlated to last year's operations. Okay. Prior year bills are anything that the city received um, for services rendered 2021 and before. The grant over expenditures and these other items, I'll double check to confirm the year in which those were incurred, but the main deferred charges are from 2021, which I believe I, I separate. Sure, so for 2022, I mean, I just, whatever it is, I, I just want to, can we get the, breakdown of what the yeah. causes, where were the over expenditures, um, you know, and, and where did that that come from? Yeah, not a problem. And, and then you have the 2021 audit, so it's it's list the four things, 2021 over expenditure appropriations, 17.5 million. And then further in the budget book, I just want to make, there's item G, with prior consent of local finance board cash deficit of preceding year 11.4 million. So I just want to make sure that those are separate items, right? So there's an additional 17 million of over expenditure that we're addressing plus the 11 million, which is the five year. They are they are correlated. The cash deficit is cash right. and the over the deferred charges are. Over expenditures and budget line items, so when we overexpend. We spend cash that in theory we don't have and essentially you're getting we're getting hit twice uh, on the budget with it. As you saw last year we had a $35 million cash deficit, but we also had over expenditures of appropriations and other items. So they are separate, but you know, one triggers the other. Okay. So I just want to make sure I understand and then how much we're we're expending in this year's budget related to 21 over expenditures and 22. So anything outside of the cash deficit, there shouldn't be any reoccurring deferred charges in our budgets over the next few years. Again, contingent on this year's operations and the result of other audits. But right now we don't we're not anticipating anything material uh, like the 2021 audit. Okay. Um and then just going back to the, the 21 but it, um, I think one of the things I'd ask for is just sort of a breakdown of where all the over expenditures were. And, and I have looked in the audit doc and it does have like some of the revenue, um, but then it mentions interfunds. But I mean, it would seem to me that interfunds would just be a, they're a symptom, not a cause, right? You use interfunds when you don't have the money. So we're trying to figure out, I'm trying to get the full breakdown. So like all of these operating deficits, over expenditures, deferred charges, where did they all stem from? 
and just that clear, you know, bullet pointed understanding or Excel sheet that really just outlines each and every one. Uh, so we all know what happened. Yeah, they are in the AFS, right? The Allowing me to speak. Steve Wilcott's how are everybody. Um, so essentially, there were in 2022, there was about $8 million of deferred charges accumulated. It was 2 million was over expenditure appropriations and 4.6 million was over expenditure of appropriation reserves. That happened. Too. Sorry, can you just define the difference between those two, just so we're all on the same page? Well, the appropriations, the 2 million are from the 2022 budget. Okay. The 4.6 million were for 2021 reserve budget in 2022. Okay. Now. Yeah, sure, yeah. What happens? Could we have the mic, please? So, so you have a budget that says you have in 2023, right? If you have a million dollars for a line item, you only spend 900,000. A hundred thousand dollars gets reserved in the subsequent year budget. So that'll be a 2024 appropriation reserve, which is really a 2023 budget amount that you did not spend. Yeah. So, so that's the difference between an appropriation, which is a current year expense that you're you're raising in the budget, and then mm -hmm. a reserve would be from the first subsequent year. Could, for the last year. So, so two million for over expenditures of 22, and then an additional four million of over expenditures in 21 from the reserves in 22 from the 21 21 reserves. reserves. Got it. Now, to your other question on the deficit, yeah. the interfunds actually play a material piece of this, right? Because in New Jersey's funky accounting methodology, right. if you have an interfund in the current fund that is due from another fund, you have to fully reserve it, which is a charge to your current year operations. So, what happened in 21, I mean, the biggest problem was. Grants that were reimbursable grants that were expended, and I think the majority of it was COVID testing, COVID vaccines that were not reimbursed by December 31st. That was about $50 million worth of expenses that you laid out for the grants that didn't come back by December 31st. So, what happens is you then have to charge your current year operations at 50 million dollars it was a combination of those thing those kinds of things and the revenue shortfalls the most uh, material one was the franchise fee from the mua because they had their own set of circumstances right because they it was a moratorium on shutoffs mm -hmm. and it was a moratorium on uh you know liens for unpaid charges so they didn't have the money to pay the city city takes the hit because again you anticipate a revenue you don't realize the revenue you have a deficit in revenues that plus the interfunds advanced were the ma majority of why you had an operating deficit right. and, and i guess what i'm sort of looking for is that explanation with the numbers attached to it so saying uh -huh. okay 50 million was a grants issue and we actually anticipate that in 2022 we did because I know for FEMA we got some of that back MUA was whatever 17 million that they didn't give us because then you know and then you know mm -hmm. revenue drop you know municipal revenues was 10 million less pilot revenues was 30 million less that, that breakdown so then we all we then know where each of those things happened slash you know maybe it was a police over expenditure was another portion of what caused it right so that that, that full breakdown is what and, and, yeah. and so the over expenditures yeah. were part of it right but they weren't the material part of it. sure you, you you could have survived the over expenditure piece of it right but when you don't collect 25 million dollars in revenue and you have an interfund advance of over 50 million dollars charged to your current your operations mm -hmm. and 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 the proof kind of is in the pudding because you went from a deficit to generating over a $90 million surplus right. in 22 because those interfunds were repaid. Right. 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 And that, and that's, that's where like it, 
that breakdown is great. Okay, what inter funds were repaid, and then what what weren't? Right, what were revenue losses we're never going to get back? So you know, technically, could you know, could we even explore our options of trying to get money from the MUA? And I, you know, but it, really, like, you got money. That, the, the MUA ended up paying it, right? But they paid it in twenty two, right? Which then right. becomes right. So, yeah. so you collected it twice in twenty two, right? So right, so that's and then that's why the surplus is higher, and just really breaking that all down for us line by line, so then we we can, all know that, right? And Councilman, um, I will say like. Uh, that's kind of sort of my budget ask request yeah. to the director's office. I'm asking for a position for financial and data reporting. I get that we speak in, and talk right. in Excel, and the, yeah. the language that we speak here isn't translatable. Um, we did prepare um, a resolution for our financial package of software. Like our software is dated. Like I, every in in my presentation right now, the dashboard that I created for grants manual, the dashboard I'm creating for um, procurement manual. And it's because we haven't updated our financial reporting system and, and our consultants can say, you know, and we're trying to pull the data that we have right now, it doesn't speak in real time. And that's the objective that I'm trying to get to so that when yeah. we speak, you guys get it and then the, it's clear. And that's that, you know, and then to the grants piece, yeah. we established a grants division. If there's abilities with the amendment process, I would like to staff that office up because that's a, that's a huge piece, right? And so we've I've set the fundamentals of frameworks so that we can get there. You have the concrete ideas, and now I think it's about you know getting into this like new days of age of reporting, transability, and so on and so forth. But in order for me to do this, I got to meet with to do the procurement dashboard. I have to literally meet with Raquel every Friday, right. state line item by line item in a financial management system that's over 30 years old. And so we're going to do that for you, and it's going to come in time so that when we give you the AFS, which is a, a state mandated document that's kind of sort of dated and you're reading through it, you'll have those good pictures and goals. But could I ask a question? Just like he explained, you know, how we got to the deficit and things like that. Why couldn't they just put that on the last sheet of the um, of the um, budget and explain it? I, I just it seemed like it's simple if we do that. It's simpler that you hand it to the council that way, and it's simpler when you post it online so the public could understand exactly what happened. It seemed like that's a simple way to do it. I'm not waiting for a system. It seemed like we could type this up now and do it based on his explanation. It's not difficult. But I, I, I'm just saying, instead of waiting for something because people are, you know, people are upset about the taxes and they know how much debt we in. And, you know, he explained it so well how we got here, I think is important for the public to know exactly how we got here. And we can do a summary. That council in your packet, I am mm -hmm. as an mm -hmm. give you the visual, you'll see what we're building. And it's not that we're waiting for the 14 month implementation plan. Mm -hmm that we're working day to day with the staff that I have to get you the data that we need. Mm -hmm. And that's the objective. So you have examples of where the department is going. So you get it so that when we have our um, advisors here that helps structure why we're at, you'll get the information. Mm -hmm. It's not that we're going to wait, mm -hmm. but this is kind of sort of the reality where I'm at. And we're, and yeah, but just what he said, I, I'm just saying, could, yeah. could we still get that yeah. in the package for the public to know and for us to know? I understand what you're saying, but he explained it so, and some people will see it and some people won't. But if we have a summary, it's easier to explain. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, if you guys could just get that in the next you know, week or so, just Correct. have that as we're looking through the budget. And then the, one last thing, I apologize. For yeah. I'm just going to say in the interest of time, it is coming up on 12 o'clock. We're about a half an hour behind, even though I know we started late. Yep. So um, if we could just take one or two more questions. I know the, the library um, folks are here patiently waiting to give us their so, presentation. So yeah. Um, yeah. just, you know, not to cut everybody short, but just to keep a time. I'll, I'll email just you. Clarify one. There was a question before about the surplus right. and using the 60 plus million dollars. Right. Part of that is the it's funding over $25 million of one-time appropriations. So once these deferred charges are funded in this budget, they go, they come off. Right. The, some of them are, yeah, we have the 11 million every year, but. Right, right, but it, four years. there's 25 million of other deferred this year, charges right. that are one time, they get funded, they're gone. Yeah. So that takes 68 down to 43. Sure. And, and again, part of the reason Kyle did, did the five-year budget projection. That was one of the requests from Jacqueline Suarez, the, right. the director of local government services and the chairwoman of the local finance board yeah. in, in the conversation process of, allow, of them allowing the city to do the five-year deferred charge to fund the balance of the deficit right. and raise it over five years. Right. 
Makes sense. So um, I have a few things I'll email. So just the last question I just want to ask here was, you know, and this was getting into what we were just talking about, but, you know, we, we have the, we got the AFS done, you know, much sooner this year than last, which is great. And obviously that gives us, I think, more confidence in the numbers, but it's, you know, and the audit will go through it and see if anything's missed. But I just want to ask, you know, do, are we confident that, you know, we've identified all of the 2022 over expenditures? So when we get to our budget amendment, you know, whether it's this month or next month, we're, we're not going to have any kind of big surprises related to the, the 2022 over expenditures. I don't believe so. I mean, Kyle and I worked together and Kyle also worked with your auditor right. in going through the, the 22 budget report to make sure that we captured everything that we right. that we all believed sans having the audit that needed to be captured. Okay. Um, Councilman, like um, there was a shared service agreement with our former comptroller that just left. And the reason why I asked to, to keep retaining her is because institutional knowledge walks out and we're trying to really be, you know, inherent information where people have left and we don't have that transparency. And so we are you know, going to be putting in that contingency planning right. planning efforts so that we don't have um, a repeat of last year or prior years and just modernizing some of those efforts so you have the confidence that we're up to date and we're up to par. Okay, thank you all. Any final questions? Okay, thank you. Motion to adjourn at 12 o'clock p.m. Second. Oh, motion. Motion second. <laughs> okay. Motion made by Councilperson Prinzeri, second by Councilperson Saleh. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. We are finished here at 12 p.m. Thank you. Our next scheduled public hearing is with the library. Yeah, that going around. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, uh, we're ready to begin. May you introduce yourself for the, are we recording? May, yep, can you, we can't hear you. Introduce yourself for the record, thank you. That better? Yeah, here we go. Perfect. All right, uh, good afternoon. I am Terry Hill, the library director for the Jersey City Free Public Library, and I have Charles Hatchett with me. Um, he's the director of finance for the library. So um, what I would like to do. One second, I just have to start the meeting. OK, OK, thank you. Okay. Thank you for everyone with your patience. We're starting a little late, but uh, we'll get there. Um, good afternoon. We are on the record. Today is Thursday, the first day of June 2023. This is a budget hearing for the Jersey City Public Library with the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 1130 AM start and the clock of my cell phone is showing 1207 PM. May we have a roll call for the commencement of the budget hearing? Councilperson Prinzeri, Councilperson Bagiano. Councilperson Saleh. Here. Councilperson Solomon. Just stepped out. Oh, okay. And may uh, Council President Waterman. Okay, so right now we have four members of the council in attendance at 12.07 p.m. In addition, at the time of its preparation, the notice of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, May 26, 2023, at 3.10 p.m. to the Municipal Council, Mayor, Business Administrator, Corporation Council, and the local newspapers. So I can certify as to our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. And as our chair today is Councilperson Saleh. Thank you so much. And thank you for this uh, budget hearing. I would like to have the directors and everyone at the table, please um, introduce yourselves. Terry Hill, director of the Jersey City Free Public Library. Charles Hatchett, director of finance, Jersey City Public Library. Nandula, Finance Director, City of Jersey City. Kyle Greaves, Jersey City Finance Department. Thank you. May I begin. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, what I would like to do is first start with uh, this document um, for the Jersey City Free Public Library operating budget and just walk you through um, what we have planned for uh, this year for our budget allocation, as well as pointing out some of our uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, there should be a total of three documents in your in your packet, and we'll get to the other two in, in just a moment. So as you'll see, um, the second slide is really just our organization chart. Um, the uh, blue boxes are leadership of the organization, the orange and gold and purple are all of our front facing uh, services and our support services are there in the uh, green boxes as well. The next page are uh, a lot of our key challenges and opportunities. Um, I need for contingency reserve funds, monitoring our salary and benefits. Uh, also investing in our facilities. Uh, that is one area that we really need to, to focus on. Uh, to make sure that our facilities are providing the kinds of spaces that people need uh, to to work in the way they do in libraries today. Uh, we are also looking at how we redistribute our collections budget, um, looking at the percentage of what we spend on 
print books versus electronic. There's high demand for electronic resources, especially ebooks. Uh, and just to give you an example, the the cost of that when we pay twenty five or thirty dollars for a print book, that same book usually costs us eighty or ninety dollars electronically, and that's usually just for one uh, single access, depending on the publisher or, or platform. So um, there's some considerations we have there. Uh, also, on our next slide, we'll look at uh, our library compared to some of our identified peer institutions across the country. Uh, another um, opportunity and challenge that we do have is um, the demographics within Jersey City and providing materials in languages spoken by residents here. Uh, it is extremely difficult to find materials and inexpensive too to find materials that represent uh, our community. So that's that's kind of an ongoing challenge. And then, of course, um, a challenge, you know, looking forward is um, something that we're we're all there are a lot of unknowns that we all have. So next next page we have uh, for our peer library comparison. This is looking at uh, budgets for 20, 21 and 22. As you see, uh, Jersey City's listed here at the top and particularly far right corner for uh, budget per capita. Um, you'll see that we are uh, well below our other peers. So these libraries were um, identified as with comparable demographics and population size. St. Paul, Minnesota, Madison, Wisconsin, St. Louis, Pittsburgh. Uh, so that's just to give you an idea of kind of where we stand in comparison to uh, to our peers. We have a question. Yeah. Director, just on the per capita comparison, um, I just want to, conf and I don't actually know how, how this works on our budget, for, for these healthcare and pensions for library employees, are those included in your allocation, or are those just in the city's general budget allocation? They're they're included. The pensions in the cities, yeah. You said, and it just for this comparison, do you know how St. Paul and Madison and and those ones handle that? Because I just want to make sure. I mean, it, this is a it's a really good chart. I just want to make sure that that the per capita comparison is is fully accurate. Because if, for example, if they're including healthcare and pensions, that might adjust the the budgets there yeah i'm not sure about those that particular. i mean we can just work on it maybe because because if if we are that much below per capita i want to know that i want to make sure that you know we're we're getting that the analysis Absolutely. There. okay um moving forward uh to into our budget categories um our 2023 Revenue, uh, total revenue, we're looking at uh, 18.6 million. Of course, 17.8 uh, of that is the uh, municipal appropriation. We also get uh, 135,000 in state aid, which has also been underfunded, uh, and that's all libraries across New Jersey. Uh, currently, libraries are receiving about 35% of what we're supposed to get from the state. Um, and then the remaining amount um, would be made up from grants that we receive, uh, particularly the grants that um, we fund our literacy department with. Uh, we also do have a, a new focus on fundraising. Uh, we have reconstituted our library foundation. Um, they, uh, as of today, have five board members and uh, they are they're starting to gain some traction to uh, bring in donors uh, to support the library as well. Uh, the next one, salary and benefits. Um, this, this, this projection includes all of our current vacant positions, but it does not include the staff we need to hire for the Holland Garden branch, and that will be about uh, eight to ten uh, positions we would need to uh, fund for that. But I do also want to be mindful of um, the, the percentage are that we spend in salary and benefits uh, with us being a public service institution. Uh, it will it will always be our largest expense, but I make sure we're keeping a balance there um, and making sure that the investment the community is making in the library is is actually going back out. And, and of course, our staff, they are our number one resources as well, but we do need to watch that that number closely. Uh, the next page would be our facilities and maintenance. Um, so this would also include any supplies that we need to purchase for maintenance and uh, and repairs. Uh, we also anticipating increased vehicle expenses. Uh, we're looking at bringing on a new bookmobile over the next year um, and just you know insurance gas prices, those kinds of things. But we are also 
uh, hoping for a reduction in our capital outlays. So as you know, Jersey City Library has 10 locations across the city, and seven of those are uh, City of Jersey City buildings. So there are three that we uh, that we rent separately. Um, and we have we have spent, uh, I think, over the past two and a half years or so, right at a million dollars out of our operating to cover some of the capital requirements that we have. So um, that is an area that we need to, to think about. Uh, next uh, slide will be about our collections and resources. I mentioned earlier, looking at how much we invest in electronic resources and the um, the uh, re rising costs with those with those types of uh, resources. At the end of 22, we did uh, um, put an extra $200,000 toward eBooks alone. And what that did for for the community was uh, our average wait time for an eBook was 130 days, which was just totally unacceptable. The national average is about 40 days uh, to wait for an eBook to be available. Um, with that extra $200,000, we were able to trim that down to about 70 days. And, and again, our goal is to get down to around 40 or 45 days uh, wait list. Because that does cause quite a lot of frustration for people. Because as we all know, with, with our electronic behavior, when we go to get something online, we expect it to be there instead of having to wait 130 days to, to get a book. We are also investing in software that's going to help us uh, analyze our current print collection uh, down to the branch level. So we will be able to be more strategic about the uh, books that we do buy to make sure it's things that the community and that community specifically around that branch are looking for. Um, and, and from that data, we would also, um, it would also be able to recommend materials that, that would more likely circulate from those locations. Because right now our, our circulation is, uh, is pretty low for print materials. And, and again, because some of the shift is to electronic, but also we need to make sure for people who want print books, we have the things that they are looking for. Uh, next one, technology. Um, we do, you know, uh, we just did a hardware uh, refresh uh, for our staff and public computers. Uh, so that, that's an ongoing cost that we have to make sure that our, our staff have the uh, equipment they need, but also that um, our customers who come in to use our computers have, have the most up-to-date hardware and software. Um, we also are wanting to um, invest in emerging technologies because my, my goal is for the library to be a place uh, kind of like a technology incubator that uh, technologies that people may not have access to in their personal lives, they can come to the library, get their hands on those things uh, to learn how to, to use those um, different types of equipment. Of course, uh, our popular hotspots and laptop lending, that's uh, another very popular service we have. And of course, we cover the data cost on um, the hotspots as well. Uh, next one's program and services. Um, this is probably one of our more visible areas, but um, actually probably costs us the least, really, because um, we do work hard to establish a lot of partnerships, whether with uh, city agencies uh, or other nonprofits, to make sure that we're able to really expand our impact as long as you know both organizations' uh, uh, missions are are aligned. So that's that's one way that we are able to provide so many programs uh, for a lower cost. Now, this cost does not include um, the funding for the community awareness series, which uh, is now fully funded by the library. Um, but that is uh, an area that uh, I have I've tried to set some expectations that we move in in new and different directions for the programming out of that that organization. And I would just like to also point out too that you know as you're you're in the community singing the praises of of the library, a couple of things when it comes to our programs and services that that we really should be proud of is our literacy department. And that department, uh, through that department, you can get your GED, and that's something that's very rare for public library to offer, and for someone to be able to come and do that with no cost as well. Also, Biblioteca Criolla, our Spanish language collection. That is the largest Spanish language collection in the state of New Jersey. Um, but it, in addition to the collection, it's also a cultural center as well. 
Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, community awareness here, uh, performing arts department of the of the library. So those are three things that we we really can be proud of uh, with the Jersey Library. Uh, the next slide, administrative costs. Um, we've really been investing in making the library more visible. You may have seen some of our faces on the NJ Transit bus around the city. Um, actually, I had a friend text me a picture last night. He was on 78 behind a bus that had my picture on it. Um, so um, so those kinds of things are bringing awareness, making sure that we are participating in more of the events around the city. Um, you know, just for that publicity, we ran a uh, library sign up campaign last year between April and De end of December, and we signed up over 15,000 new card holders in that amount of time. Uh, that is still a priority for us to get people engaged with the, the library, trying to make that process easier too for them to get a library card. We are also doing a lot of work with the schools. Uh, we're currently in the process of uh, figuring out a way to have every public school student uh, be assigned a library card. Uh, so we've got to work out the data transfer approach at, with the school system, but we're hoping to have that up and running this fall. Uh, and the last page on this, uh, some of our priorities going forward. Um, right now we have our Lafayette branch that's under renovation. That's on uh, Pacific Avenue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at uh, imp implementing a new bookmobile that will be a little smaller than a big blue bus, but uh, will also provide books and also space on there for STEAM and STEM activities uh, that we could uh, host programs on it as well. Some technology investments, uh, RFID, that's really um, would help us with our book inventory, but also on the patron side, what the uh, the big advantage there would be, we would have self checkout machines where if you come in and you check out 25 books, instead of having to scan each one, you just sit it down on the machine and it checks out all of them and you're you're on your way. So there's some time saving there and it really helps us keep up with our, our inventory. Uh, I mentioned the collection management tool that we're going to be uh, investing in. And uh, and then as far as fundraising and capital expansion, we have the fourth phase of the Gardner main renovation uh, and then some critical needs that we have at the um, Miller branch. If we could, um, well, first, are there any questions about any of these? Yeah, I just like to ask one question. Uh, on the expense administrative, you have insurance increases. Isn't doesn't the city of Jersey City cover you? Library has its own policy for the materials that we keep on hand within the library. The structural buildings uh, insurance costs are bear, borne by the city. Right. Any questions, Councilman? I, I have a few. Um, do you you spoke a lot about fundraising? Yeah. Do you have a goal in mind number? Are there any events um, coming up later down the year, like a gala or a night at the library, museum, whatever kind of event? Or uh, no, we don't have a, a goal set at this at this point, um, and that's kind of the next step that the foundation board will be taking. Um, my my hope is that we can organize and launch a campaign. Uh, specifically to um, support some of those uh, highlighted programs that I mentioned, as well as uh, money toward uh, refreshing our, our facilities. Um, as far as an event goes, uh, I know the development officer uh, mentioned to me just this week that they're looking at a October or November event sometime in the fall, but that hasn't been. There, there may be smaller events that they have, They've been having some social hours and things like that just to bring awareness to the foundation. And I get this question a lot from constituents. Mm -hmm. It's regarding how to donate books. Is that something that the Jersey City Public Library does? Like it doesn't depend on the condition. Is there a way for for people to donate books to the library? We currently don't accept donations. OK. Um, I we do have a Friends of the Five Corners branch. And uh, that's one group I want to talk to to see if they would be interested in accepting donations. Because uh, part of our challenge is, uh, as you can imagine, when people donate books, it's things they don't want. And the condition may not be good enough for us to put on the shelf. We may already have a bunch of copies. 
number of things. Uh, but at this at this point, we don't accept uh, donations. Is there a I, I know you said that. There's a, a difference between when you get the ebooks, it costs maybe three times more than the traditional print book. Um, how are you identifying which books to get in the ebook version versus which ones to get in the traditional or there's certain demographics that you're going after, like let's say the young people get an ebook in Harry Potter versus, you know, maybe like Gone with the Wind might be traditional, you know? <laughs> right, right. Well, a lot depends on what's available with uh, in ebook format uh, because everything that's printed is not available. So that's that's one level of criteria right right there. Um, but certainly popular materials that come out that are available in ebook, we make sure we have both print and uh, electronic version. Is there, um, I saw that you're looking at technology like RFID um, for, is that for the library card? That's for the book itself. Oh, the book so, itself. Yeah, we would have to go through and tag every book that we have. Um, and one that would help us clean up our database that we maintain on the backside. And then on the user end, uh, you can be more sure that when you search for a book in the catalog, it's really going to be on the shelf because right now we have a lot of things that um, are on the shelf that may not be in the catalog or in the catalog may not be on the shelf. So we're, we're going to get a lot of that cleaned up so that saves time and frustration for the patron coming in. I love the idea of automatic signups for students of the Jersey City Public School System to be automatically signed up to go to the Jersey City Public Library. Um, is this just like in the initial phases or where are we in terms of a glide path towards achieving that reality? Right now we're trying to work out the specifics of the data exchange and being mindful of privacy issues for the students because the school system will have to send us students information. So we're trying to work out exactly what information we need in our system to be able to have an actual record for them without violating privacy. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's all on my end. Anyone else? Right. I've raised three kids in the city here, and I also have grandkids here. Library is a fantastic organization. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so our next uh, document I want to go through um, is this one. It's a draft of our capital improvement plan. And this is not the complete plan. So what you will find here are the locations with issues that um, that we see as as the most critical uh, needs for improvements and, and repairs. Uh, so the architect Helena Ruma, who's been working with the library buildings for for many, many years, um, she went through each branch and and documented took photos of, of all the things that um, we do need to to fix. And our, our top priority is our Miller branch. Uh, and as you can see, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, pa four pages in, uh, or back of the second page, probably on your, on your uh, printout. Uh, there are some Im images here of um, some of the issues we are facing at the, the Miller branch. Uh, she also lists out some of the past uh, SKIP projects. Um, but just I mentioned earlier, we'd spent about a million dollars of operating funds over the past uh, two to two and a half years on on capital repairs. Uh, about 500,000 of that has just been within this year and in 22 uh, just on Miller branch. Uh, this facility celebrated its 100th anniversary at this past fall. And um, it is in quite disrepair. Uh, there's there's a lot of water coming into the building every time it rains. Um, we have rotting window sills, um, and of course, I mean this. These things didn't happen overnight. This has been years uh, and decades of uh, decline for this facility. But uh, we did have to do some emergency repairs on the uh, facade, on the front side. We had some places where there, the concrete was shipping off and falling. Um, so we've we've got some of that repaired. 
Um, the scaffolding just came down a couple of weeks ago for that, but um, we've we've got some serious issues here that we really need need to address. And the other concern I have with having uh, my staff and the public in that building too is because of the amount of water coming in. Uh, there's probably a good bit of mold there as well, and I I do want to make sure that that is addressed. Um, just for safety reasons. The other thing is the building's not ADA compliant as well, so that's something else we need to uh, address there. Any questions? I was going to ask. I know earlier earlier you stated that the state has cut funding. Um, have you met with any of the state uh, legislators in terms of procuring more funding, and what has their response been? Yeah. Well, all of all of our local representatives at the state level have all been very much in support of it. Um, also, the New Jersey Library Association every year is uh, advocating for full funding, and um, I'm I'm just getting caught up enough on you know things on a statewide level to know how they kind of operate. But um, it it doesn't seem like there's going to be there's not really statewide support for that. Um, so, but it is it is something that that we speak about with state like officials on a regular basis. This one seems like very dire, the Miller branch. So, yeah, th this one is, um, and I don't know, Charles, if you have anything because you you've had more history with the building too. Yeah, uh, if you have anything you want to add, well, thank you. We um, during COVID, we tried to clean many of the library buildings. And what we were able to do in the Miller branch was basically some painting and scraping in some key areas. However, more currently, the roofing and some of the window areas are really beginning to expose. They're, they're showing their time exposure. So the roof is more than 25 years old. We've had it patched. We're planning to have that done out of our, out of our current year's budget. And the windows, we're hoping to really get Maybe some assistance from the city or from, our, excuse me, our foundation. So we'll have a bid on that, and I think there are costs associated in this in this brochure. Would that be one of the objectives? Certainly, we would appreciate any help you can give us. To also highlighted in that packet, um, there's information about the uh, the Heights branch. Uh, Earl Morgan, Five Corners, uh, Cunningham Branch, uh, and the Pavonia Branch. Um, we also just recently had an issue with the air at the Pavonia Branch. Uh, we had to shut that facility down for a few days, um, so the uh, condensing units need to be replaced Replaced there. And they're currently on order? Okay, so we've, okay. we've ordered those for, for the uh, Pavonia Branch. Um, the heights, uh, as you'll see here, the, the steps need to be uh, repaired there. So um, a lot of these critical things that we've pointed out are, are certain, they are critical, but they are also ADA compliance and, and just kind of life safety issues that, that we do need to address with these. Have we incurred any incidents regarding the steps at the Heights Branch Library? Not that we're- Not yet. Yeah. Okay, it's gonna happen. So as uh, Helena finishes this um, this capital plan, I, I'd be glad to to share the entire plan with you. She's also getting cost estimates um, just based on her experience uh, and deep knowledge of the buildings. Um, she's estimating that these most critical needs would probably come in around 13 million total for for all of these facilities. That's that's just to get the basic things done. Can I ask, uh, yep. is, that, is, that all, is that all director? Sure. No, okay. I was, all right. do you have any questions? There's a question, yep. Sorry, and I apologize if you, if you covered this and I missed it, but you know, have, have you, um, you know, brought this capital request kind of to the administration and the budget office, and, and can you sort of give us a sense of what those conversations have looked like? 
Yeah, I have I have spoken um, a few weeks ago with the mayor, so he he has a copy of this to be able to to look over it. But we haven't had any further discussions. Got it. And and would I, I assume? But I assume these would all be capital costs here. Okay. You can't. You guys can't bond yourselves. It would have to be the city. Yeah, right. That's what I assumed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. No. And uh, and then finally, uh, I just wanted to point out a project that we are uh, we have underway. So you may be aware that the Priscilla Gardner Main Library has gone uh, through three phases of renovation, and now we are at the fourth and we hope the final phase for for quite some time. Uh, what we have done with this uh, renovation plan, uh, well. First, we did receive uh, a grant from the state library for five million dollars, which the city is also matching for. We have a total budget of, of ten million dollars. So when I arrived in 21, there was a, an initial plan put together, but it was really focused on providing more space to store books. And we had the opportunity to kind of course correct and, and take advantage of bringing someone in who could help us design space that's going to be conducive to how people use libraries in the 21st century. And also maintaining the historical components of the of the building, because that is probably one of the most beautiful buildings we have in in Jersey City. If um, and certainly as far as libraries goes, it, it certainly certainly is. Uh, so we engage the services uh, of a space planner who um, has worked with libraries across the country. He came in to do a space audit. He sat in the library a couple of days and just kind of noted how people were using space, what needs they fear to have, those kinds of things. Um, this packet uh, will outline a lot of uh, his thoughts uh, and, and the plan that we're wanting to move forward with, uh, with, the, with the Gardner Main. Um, and it's really moving things around in the building to make the, the building a little more intuitive. Um, we with this new plan, we would have the entire fourth floor dedicated to children and teens. So teens would actually have their own space, which is something that's that's very critical for that age group. Um, and on the first floor would be more of a community area. We would have uh, an area that uh, the, the current children's area would be more like a marketplace. So if you think about the bookstore experience you walk into, you have books that are displayed with the, the face of the book out. Uh, we would have, you know, highlight different types of books. There are new books, those kinds of things. Uh, so it would be a more social space. Putting in a, 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 a coffee cafe or something on the first floor, but uh, really honing in on the idea of it being a third place for the community and activating those those spaces in that way. Um, through uh, toward the back of that package, you'll see some of the initial renderings. Um, one thing that, um, that uh, the space planner pointed out with with a lot of the historical buildings he's worked with across the country, um, many of them don't have an opportunity like this, but still dealing with putting in new windows and those kinds of things. Um, but we we see this as a real opportunity for the library and for and for Jersey City and and really could kind of set the bar for how you can utilize a historic building for today's library purposes. Um, so if you know when you have time, if you can just take a look uh, through that um, that plan, and and I would certainly welcome any any feedback or thoughts you you have on that. We currently have the the new plan in with the state library for approval for the for going in this direction, which we we don't anticipate any challenges with that because um, there's even some graphs in there that show you the the amount of uh, user space that we gain by going in this this direction. This will help. Any questions from my council colleagues? Uh, great presentation. I'll end off on this. Um, you know, show me great library and I'll show you a great society. Is there a library system that you have looked at that, you know, we should be emulating or modeling and, um, you know, you tell us about that. Two come to mind, uh, the Colum Columbus Metro Library in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, also the Nashville Public Library in Tennessee. Those are 
in, to my mind, are, are two of the top ones uh, that are in cities kind of similar to us as far as population goes uh, and, and size of the library. But um, those those libraries, well, Nashville in itself has an extremely strong foundation. Uh, they're they're probably sitting on sixty million dollars, just their foundation. Um, but the level of support and engagement that they have in in their community uh, is is always been impressive. Uh, Columbus does an excellent job of seeming to always be one step ahead of their community's needs and providing uh, resources and opportunities for you know things that people didn't even realize they needed. Th those are kind of my two models that I look at. Any final words on your end? No. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Motion to adjourn. Hey, I have a motion to adjourn this budget hearing at 1241 p.m. by Councilperson Slay. May I have a second? Second by Councilperson Prinzeri. All in favor to a motion to adjourn at 1241 p.m. All council members present by acclamation, please say aye. We are out of here at 12.41 p.m. Thank you so much, everybody here, everybody watching at home. Remember, teamwork makes the dream work. And we'll be back after a short lunch break with the Lord Department. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. So
Okay. Welcome back everyone. Good afternoon. We are on the record. Today is Thursday, the first day of June, the year 2023. This is a budget hearing for the law department with the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 1.30 p.m. start and the clock on my cell phone is showing 1.43 p.m. Okay, we have a roll call for the commencement of this budget hearing and I see Councilperson Prinzeri, Councilperson Baggiano. Yeah. Councilperson Soleil. Here. Here. And Council President Waterman. Okay. We have four council members in attendance at 1.43 p.m. In addition, at this time of its preparation, the notice of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, May 26, 2023 at 310 p.m. to the mayor, municipal council, business administrator, corporation council, and the local newspapers, so I can certify as to our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. And I am going to turn this over to our chairperson for the law department's uh, budget hearing, and that's Councilperson Select. Thank you, Sean. And I want to thank anyone who's watching online and uh, all those here in person. I would like for our esteemed guests to introduce themselves so that we can commence the law department budget hearing. Oh, wait, uh, wait, hold, hold on. I'm sorry. Councilman Solomon, are you? Uh, Nice. Okay, he's here. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Council President, members of the Council, Peter Baker, Corporation Council for the City of Jersey City. Good afternoon, Council President, Council Members, Brittany Murray, First Assistant Corporation Council. Kyle Greaves, Finance Department. Penny Beige, not Finance Department. You may proceed. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Council Persons. Um, um, Peter, I'm I'm so sorry. It's we close those doors, please. Actually, yeah. Can we just close the side door? And I'm going to mark Council Person Solomon present at 146. So we have five members present at 146 p.m. Okay, Corporation Council. Sorry about that. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, I will, if uh, the council is good with it, I will walk the council first through uh, what we think are some notable changes in our request this year. We have had a couple uh, notable things I want to touch on first. Um, and then I can, you know, we can do an item by item walk through if that is good with the council. Um, so probably the primary things that we have changed, um, we have uh, instituted and started a, um, we've increased our, in-house tax appeal group. We have hired an additional attorney, one additional full-time attorney, one additional part-time attorney uh, to assist with uh, bringing more of the tax appeals in-house. Um, as I've been telling the council now for some time, we've had um, the tax courts have been frozen because of COVID. They are now unfreezing, so we are moving more files along. Um, we are hopeful that by next year, we will see that the budget for outside counsel for these tax appeals is reduced substantially. Um, we currently have 2,427 tax appeals that are pending for the state. These date back to 2010. Um, in 2022, we had 1,012 filed. In 2023, we had 2,966 filed, so it almost tripled in one year. Um, and I think recognizing the fact that right now we have we previously we had one attorney in the house who was handling tax appeals. Uh, that was Mr. Will Maslow. Uh, he would quite simply be unable to handle that workload. Um, another aspect of the tax appeal group that is changing is that we are now. Filed over 200 affirmative reverse appeals, which are intended to correct what had been potential misassessments, under assessments, et cetera. Um, they would be heard before, obviously, the county tax board, potentially state court. Uh, this one, it corrects, you know, what are some misassessments, which would then correct other assessments in the surrounding area. Two, this would also increase, potentially increase revenue for the city fairly substantially. 
Um, I can tell the uh, council right now that um, just we currently have pending 359 reverse appeals before the county board. We have uh, set we have already settled in 2022 ta um, ta reverse tax appeals that would projected revenue result in an increase of seven hundred seventy two thousand one hundred eighty six dollars and seventy nine cents. Um, we currently have proof hearings scheduled uh, for 2022 appeals, uh, which again, this is a projection. These are this is not these are not dollars we have still have to collect the dollars, but could result in close to one point nine million dollars in tax revenue. Um, there are then 57 other 2022 appeals that are still pending, and this is separate from the reverse appeals for 2023 that have been filed. Like I said a moment ago, that were 359 those appeals. Um, and again, we have brought on two attorneys to assist with this increase. Uh, the salaries for the full salary for the full time was 120,000. Part time was 60,000. Uh, so we think the math works out very well. That uh, increase. The, uh, bringing the attorneys on staff full time, uh, one of whom gets benefits, the other is part time, does not get benefits, pension, et cetera, uh, has been extremely cost effective. And I'll obviously report back to the council and let everybody know how this process carries out uh, throughout the summer. Um, are there any questions on the tax appeal piece before I move on? Um, <clears throat> when are the, um, when the, tax reverse tax appeals are resolved when does the city realize the gain from you know the reverse tax appeal is it the following year or is it that same year or we go into the following year's tax assessment provided it's resolved before october 1st i believe so then it would be on the tax rolls for 2020 the 2024 tax year uh, anything that's resolved after that date would then be rolled over to 2025 do you believe that the staffing levels for the tax group is appropriate or do you think that in the future you might need more or what's your take on that? Well, we, we're, we've kind of been looking at a pilot program. We didn't want to over hire and find that we did not. There was not enough work for the attorneys to do uh, at the present time. I can tell the council that we have, uh, if anything, there probably is a little more work than we have um there's enough to keep the two and a half attorneys busy we'll put it that way uh and at the end of the year if we feel that it's appropriate to possibly bring on additional staff we would present that as part of a budget amendment to the council uh with the total breakdown of what we have number of files number of appeals filed uh, but as it stands right now i think i'll lower it i'll lower it okay. as it stands right now i think we are at an appropriate level we did file i would say a, what we thought would be a manageable number for the staffing that we had. Uh, if it does prove to be very successful uh, with correcting some misassessments and some revenue issues, um, I think there would be the ability to increase staffing. How's that? That's good. Okay. <laughs> and I think, Peter, just to add support to it, finance law with the assessment, this is came out of that initial working group and wanting to support the law department in this work. Because historically it had just been a, um, not there. Any other questions? Can you, Peter, provide us with the uh, list of all the properties we filed appeals for in uh, 2023? Yeah, I'll send that out. Actually, can you do the 2022 list as well? Or? Yes. Great. And again, as as the council probably knows, we did have a uh, an agreement with an outside firm to do these tax appeals. Uh, they captured a flat rate of one third of whatever the um, assessment change was. Um, obviously, you know, we pay salary to our attorneys to handle that, but we are not. There's <laughs> there's no uh, cut that our attorneys get apart from their normal salary. I would say one other adjustment for this year, we have increased our um, outside counsel fee. Our outside counsel fee traditionally had been $150 per hour. That number had not changed for well over a decade. Uh, we were becoming uncompetitive with other municipalities, including much smaller municipalities that frankly send all of their work out to outside attorneys. Uh, we've increased it to $175, which is still slightly below some other municipalities. Nevertheless, it has made us uh, more competitive. Um, I think we have we've been able to um, 
and get some more attorneys on board who may not have been on board otherwise. I think this particularly applies to smaller firms that may not have the you know, the budget space to handle what is really a fairly low compensation rate. Uh, and typically those are younger attorneys who might just be starting out, who are people that we want to bring into the fold, that we want to give work to, and that you know we have found have done tremendous work for us. And we want to increase that um, those possibilities for us. Do you think that if we increased the fee and got more seasoned lawyers that there'd be a quicker resolution to some of these cases or is it um you know that it's going to take the amount of time it's going to take to resolve a dispute i i think by and large you know we we do resolve things um you know, frankly, as far as being, being the defendants in a case, it does not really behoove us usually to resolve something quickly. Um, that said, unless we are spending unnecessary counsel fees, which are drawing something out through unnecessary discovery, if it's something that we think we can resolve ahead of time. Um, the possibility is there that yes, attorneys have a higher rate. Um, I would say conceptually that is possible. However, I can just say anecdotally, I don't think there's anything that I felt has been played or has been you know, spinning the wheels in the mud because we have a, an inexperienced attorney. In fact, if I were to be frank, I think some of our you know, younger, more quote unquote hungry attorneys have tended to you know, cut to the chase a little bit. Okay, any questions? Uh, Peter, it says on the, in the spreadsheet, um, outside counsel C breakdown. Can you provide us with that breakdown? Yes. Um, this is sort of, I guess, a joint question to you guys in the in the budget office. I just see here um, the line items, um, basically everything other than the outside councils have been removed. Um, and I, is that um, going to be true for every department? Largely, you know, are office supplies now centralized? You know, kind of, you just kind of, what's going on there? Yeah. So. In addition to any cuts to vacancies and staffing, we also want to look at some discretionary items within departments, um, other expense line items, and kind of not necessarily just cut it, but kind of gauge it back to what they actually spent in prior years. So it's a combination of two things, asking departments to manage with a little less this year, but also be more realistic with their proposals and we, you know, we we want to make sure they have the, you know, what they need to operate, but we're not looking for any essentially fluff to move around at the end of the year. So we feel like this is a, you know, we'll support the department for what they need. And I would just want to note the biggest uh, cut here is professional services. It's not a reduction. It's a hundred thousand dollars that we budgeted for uh, EEO complaints and um, investigations that we moved to. The human resources budget uh, that was at that was in collaboration with the law department and HR. At that time they felt it might live better under uh, their operation, so it's not a true cut. I would say I, I, I would agree with that portion. Uh, EEO investigations really should be handled um, more correctly through human resources, particularly if it becomes a matter where litigation results from it. We don't want a situation where the law department is conflicted out of handling the litigation because they handled an EEO investigation. So if we create that separation between the uh, division and the department, uh, we virtually eliminate that for risk. So what about um, 314 contractual services, LexisNexis three year new contract? Where are we paying for that? Just a renewal. For the law. You know, I know, but it doesn't look like anything's budgeted for it, unless I'm unless there's understanding. No, there's fifty thousand. Oh, I. So, oh, sorry. I see. There's. There's. I was confused with this amendment, twenty twenty three amendment. Oh yeah. So. So the. So I, I, like the. I get it. So the. You've increased the professional services. Because of the new rate. Correct. Exactly. And so that's already built into the amendment, even though it wasn't introduced. Right. So okay, also fine. what I shared with the council prior to the meeting was. A worksheet that excluded that amendment column. That was really for internal purposes when we get to that point of okay. the budget process. So there should be nothing in those columns. Okay. We're looking at the introduced. Got it. That that was what confused me. I'm sorry. Yep. So just just to clarify, so the the increased rate was 
multiple we increased the requested amount by the different an increase from 150 to 175 is about 17 percent we asked for a 17 percent increase just to offset that i think as the council knows we do have a couple we you know we do have one at least one large case that we have resolved uh that we are intending to resolve very soon that has been a substantial uh expenditure of council fees but also we are re we are we are being reimbursed for those council fees by our insurance carrier so that will return to the general fund. Um, one other amendment that we had made to the submissions in our initial submission, which came about prior to our discussions with finance and with the business administrator um, about the reverse tax appeal project, we had put in the budget requests to hire a senior level attorney for a labor and employment section um, that the hiring of the one and a half attorneys was um, taken from, it was assigned to those two positions. However, because those positions are actually revenue positive um, as projected, uh, we have added a um, another senior attorney position at a $120,000 rate uh, for the labor and employment section, which at, at this time is currently a supervisor and one attorney. Um, we have are falling pretty substantially behind on some of our, again, frankly, some of the investigations that we do. Um, we have a candidate actually in mind who we would like to make an offer to who would fit into that spot. Um, we're hoping that, you know, obviously if the council will approve that, that we can bring that person on board. Um, and that would, you know, in in theory, in, not in theory, but in an application that will reduce our need to assign, assign matters to outside council. And this person is quite experienced in uh, all of the uh, labor matters, state uh, perk matters, uh, EEO matters that would be a tremendous asset to us. So for the labor matters, the this new attorney, they're going to be going to Perk. They're going to be doing filings and all of that, or are right. they farming it out to someone else? Like no, they, they would be handling the arguments, arbitrations, hearings, et cetera. They'd be handling, handling those personally um, under their salary. OK. Aside um, other matters, obviously overtime, we request a very nominal budget. Sometimes we do need people to stay late if there are late filings, et cetera. Um, I don't think, I don't know that we expended any overtime last, actually it was $59 and 90 cents. So we just like to keep that amount in the budget in case we uh, do need that. Um, obviously there's uh, the, uh, the normal office supplies, cleaning, sanitary supplies. Uh, communications is the PACER service, which is the federal um, court uh, document access system. Uh, there's not a lot that's discretionary there. Uh, the memberships and subscriptions, obviously we need to keep people up to date on rule changes, et cetera. Uh, we, every attorney is required to do 12 uh, legal education hours per year. We want to compensate them for that um, and also provide a training budget. And usually those two overlap. Uh, also every attorney every year needs to file the uh, state client protection fund fee, which I believe is now 200 $75? It's $275 per, per attorney. Um, mileage, I think, you know, and the courts are reopening, obviously, and I think we're going to see more expenses for parking and travel. We are seeing a lot more matters that are being handled virtually, however, mostly depositions. Um, so this number might be lower than it had been in previous pre-COVID years, but we still do anticipate a budget need. Um, Equipment maintenance and repair is that is quite literally heavy punch clock that we need to keep up, uh, up and restored um, for incoming documents, which does become very important if we're talking about when we were served and when we received documents. Um, and our contractual services, that is our LexisNexis account, which is not just the attorneys on staff here. Uh, we have a Clerk's office has a Lexis account. Planning department has a Lexis account. There are a lot, a number of public documents that live on Lexis Nexus that are very useful for our different city agencies. So we let them use um, that account as well. Uh, and I believe uh, human resources also. Okay. At this time, then I'm happy. I distributed my um, work chart. I apologize that it's very small. Um, but you can see we do have two openings under our labor and employment section. We're looking to fill one this calendar year. 
Uh, the rest of the openings, I think, you know, given some of the budget issues, we can defer until future years. Um, but the I would say that labor and employment position is fairly urgent, and we would uh, hope that we could get that built fairly soon. Um, is that the end of the presentation? And uh, that that is what I have for right now. Questions? Obviously, happy to answer. How how long will it take you to fill that position? Um, I think you know. I will say the candidate that we have, who I, I'll, I'll just omit names for privacy's sake. Yeah. I think she'd be able to start uh, next month. I mean, I'm sorry, it's now June, so possibly later this month. Okay. Because the only reason why I'm asking, I'm trying to see if our hiring process has improved because all the time, um, you know, people come and we really need them and then they don't get called back to about three months. So I'm just trying to figure out from the time you interview her um, down, how long has the wait been? Because then HR, you know, has to come before us too. And so we want to make sure the process has improved. We actually interviewed her on Friday. Oh, OK. Uh, so it's only been a few days. Oh, OK, because I, I just want to make sure the process is, is, yeah. is improving. It makes no because we lose good candidates every time, you know, we try to hire someone and then the process is so long. By the time we get back to them, they done found another job and we do need to re start to require good help. That's why I ask. So I just wanted to know. Oh, understood. And I think, you know, a lot of times we do have uh, candidates who do need to give substantial notice time. Mm -hmm. um, but that's separate and apart from the offer mm -hmm. acceptance process. Okay. Any more questions, Council President or my oh, Council good. colleagues? I have a question. Um, I know the law department, you know, has uh, this obligation to protect the city or in, in terms of like mitigating our risks. Uh, and essentially, my question is, Usually you guys are putting out fires, right? Like you, you're coming in after and like just trying to, you know, make sure that we're mitigating our exposure. What are we doing in terms of like what's the weakest, not weakest, but what is the most vulnerable part of our entire city infrastructure in terms of, you know, what's giving us a lot of ex legal exposure and what are, what are the plans to help mitigate that? Like, is it HR? Is it the police department? Is it, you know, what, what are, where are we getting the most uh, deluge of complaints and how can we tackle that and sort of get in front of that issue? I would say, you know, the, the Obviously, the city owns a lot of property and we welcome people onto our property. And when you welcome people onto your property, accidents do happen. Sometimes they can be completely you know, blameless accidents. Sometimes there are issues with you know, maybe the city didn't maintain something properly. Uh, maybe there was a report of something that was damaged or loose or broken that was not followed up upon, et cetera. Um, we have met with you know, DPW and the city to and uh, the administration to obviously encourage these departments to respond to these complaints. Um, we've, you know, I have noticed, you know, I've been in this position now for a little over five years. I think the response time has gotten substantially better. Uh, I think the, and, you know, frankly, it takes a couple of very bad events. We had an incident with a broken swing a few years ago that we had to settle for a substantial amount of money because it was fixed improperly. And that became a very direct object lesson for everybody that you can't do this. We've gotten feedback then from other departments who are very, very careful, like, hey, there was an accident involving a piece of equipment. What should I do with that piece of equipment? I said, well, if it's broken, take it out of circulation, preserve it, because if there's a claim later, we need to have that because it's, if we get rid of it, it's potentially spoliation of evidence if we're aware of the accident. So I think the education has been very helpful and productive, and it's, I think we have seen a reduction in some of these claims. Um, I think we, I, otherwise, I think a lot of claims are very connected to department size. So our largest department in the city is the public safety department. Um, second largest, I believe, is DPW. We get the majority of our claims resulting to the physical plants of the city, and which is the roads, parks, equipment, other city property, and then complaints that we get uh, relating to public safety. Now that can be motor vehicle accidents um, that do not involve a excessive force component. Now, the council obviously is aware that we do get complaints about excessive force or misconduct from 
uh, police and other uniform personnel. Um, those numbers, I believe, have improved. Um, we, I know we spoke, <laughs> we spoke off the record the other day. I'm going to get the total numbers for everything and circulate it to the council. Um, but we have seen improvement in those numbers over the past few years. Now we've also had uh, three very unusual years with people being in public, being out in the world. So is that going to reduce or change those numbers? It's hard to say, but the data is the data. All we have is what we have. Uh, so I will share that with the council. Um, and obviously we do speak to department heads. I speak to uh, Director Shea, Director Kearse, uh, Director McLaughlin quite a bit about what they need to do to limit liability. It's a two way street. We get communications from them repeatedly about you know, notifying us about things, asking for guidance, how to proceed, um, if there's anything that needs to be stopped, changed, et cetera. Those lines of communication are open and it's been productive and you know, they're following our advice. And I think that has done quite a bit to um, limit exposure and liability. Um, let's see, Brittany has been assisting with risk management for the past couple of months. She might have something to add here. I don't want to. Do you liaise with human resources? Like what kind of risk management work do you do? Right now we don't have a risk manager. Um, so I have been assisting our risk management department and HR. Um, I do deal with our insurance issues, our insurance broker who's, um, you know, been very helpful to us, but we are a self-insured public entity. So we need to um, have that money available. We're, we have different insurance policies as well for different um, types of claims or cases. Uh, we do have a very good third party administrator that helps us and keeps us on track. We work with them with normal claims. Um, you know, not every claim becomes litigation. So luckily that's where our third party administrator comes in to try to help us knock that down or some people just filing notices of claim um, just because they have to by statute, just in case a public entity is involved. That doesn't mean that turns into litigation, but that's where um, our department will work with our third party administrator as well as um, our investigator will help to make sure those don't become litigation. Um, so we do do a lot of that work to stop it. Um, and then I would agree with everything Peter said in terms of the communications among the directors and the departments. Um, none of us like when litigation comes up, we wanna stop it. Um, so we try to work with them to say, hey, we've noticed this, what can you do? Or they'll ask us like, hey, something's been brought to our attention. Can you give us more information? And we do work together on that. Um, so I believe that has helped as well um, to try to stop things before they happen. And like Peter said, it really just has to do with size. We're tasked with defending every city department and every city employee if they're in the course of their employment. Um, so that could be 3,500 people or, you know, the approximately how many we have. So it can happen uh, in any department, but it does um, depend on the size of the department because just they're doing more than others. Um, and, and that's when, you know, things happen. But our risk management team has been doing a very good job in the absence of Matt Hogan and um, been working uh, as best as they could. So they're doing a very good job too. When's the last time the uh, human resources manual or like employee handbook was updated? I believe there's we're still waiting for updates. Um, I'll ask uh, Director Rosa because I believe we were waiting to get it back. Um, but I'll ask her for that. It's a collaborative effort or it's like you they send it to you and you make sure it's all like above board legally and. Well, I think it's a collaborative effort <laughs> with okay. everybody. What does Chanel do? I think I, I just answered that question, then I'll come back yeah. to the council president. I think yes, I thought that's why she was put down there. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm I, I think once we once there is a final draft or something very close to a final draft, obviously law will go through that very, very carefully and make sure everything comports with state law, federal law, best practices, et cetera. Uh, as far as Chanel's role in um, the business administrator's office, I would have to defer to them. I know she is assigned to handle disciplinary matters mm -hmm. um, and additional matters on top of that. I believe they would have to um, elaborate on that with you, but I know we do work with her on employee disciplinary matters. So, um, so when it comes to HR, is she over HR? See, this gets confusing here. She's responsible for HR, then it falls under Jimmy or Joanne. That's what I'm saying. How is the chain of command? 
and I apologize, I'm not fully up to speed on what the um, yeah. what the org chart is uh, in human resources at this mm -hmm. time. However, I think I can yeah. I can look, or I'm sure the business administration. Yeah, because I think there's a lot of confusion down there. That's part of the problem. That's why discipline is so hard to resolve here. Because if one person is responsible for administering discipline and then you got other people who's trying to counteract that, it gets confusing and and people who need to be disciplined is really not disciplined. And we always stuck with people who are we get complaints about, but then we can't do anything about it because one side is disciplined. The other side is not. <laughs> So that's why I want to know how does the chain of command goes? Because if she's responsible for it, then she needs to be writing it up or whatever. I think obviously with that, with all the employee disciplines. Because that's what you I thought that's why when when it was presented to us, that's why she would have been. That's why she was put there for that reason to handle the discipline. So if she's put there to handle the discipline, then she need to be the one that handles the discipline and, and write it up. I don't need um, somebody from the side, the right or the left side. I don't want to say no names, you know, to counteract this if she's the one that's supposed to handle it. So, Council President, I think when human research does come in, that's mm -hmm. the ask as mm -hmm. well. But um, Chanel is the assistant business administrator. Mm -hmm. Rosa is still the director of human resources. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Carroll is still the assistant director. And so if there are, you know, discrepancies in reporting or who's handling what, understand that the, there's volumes and requests that come in, that would be best directed for them. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, because, you know, she was once in the law department and it, when they gave her over, that's what the, that was the conversation. So I'll wait, the BA's coming, the HR's coming. <laughs> we, we'll get clarity, chain of command. Any further questions from my council colleagues? Anything you'd like to add, Corporation um, Council? No, just it's been it's been a pleasure again for another year. It's been like just over five years now. The time flies. Didn't sign. I did not sign up for a global pandemic, but none of us did. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next year. And uh, obviously, if there are any questions at any time, please feel free. Everybody has my phone number. Shoot me an email. Um, more than happy to help out and uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn at 12, two, excuse me, 2.16 p.m. by Councilperson Soleil. May I have a second? Second by Councilperson Prinzeri. On a motion to adjourn at 2.16 p.m. Will council members present by acclamation please say aye. Aye. We are out of here at 2.16 p.m. Thank you so much, everyone watching at home and everyone present. Remember, teamwork makes the dream work, and we'll be back in about... 15 minutes with our next budget hearing, which is the tax assessor. Thank you so much.
He does. Okay. <laughs> we are about to get started. So the first thing I would ask everyone here is to silence their cell phones if they haven't done so already. I think Laura just stepped out too. Did she Did give her a call? We're just going to get started because I have to read Check. a couple of things into the record and then we'll be good to go. So good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Thursday, the first day of June in the year 2023. This is a budget hearing for the tax assessor with the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 2.30 p.m. start. The clock on my cell phone is showing 2.41 p.m. Okay, we have a roll call for the commencement of this budget hearing. So Councilperson Prinzieri is not here yet. Councilperson Bargiano. Councilperson Soleil. Here. Councilperson Solomon. And Council President Waterman. We have four council members present at 2.41 p.m. In addition, at its time of its preparation, the notice of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, May 26, 2023 at 3.10 p.m. To the, to the Mayor, Municipal Council, Business Administrator, Corporation Council, and the local newspapers, so I can certify as to our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. And I'm going to turn this over to the chairperson of this meeting, which happens to be Councilperson Soleil again. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you to our esteemed guests here. We are going to be reviewing the budget for the tax assessor's office. And would the guests please state their name for the record? Have a green light on there, Ed. I had Chilosa, the uh, tax assessor. Laura Takuri, deputy tax assessor. Kyle Grease, finance department. Zakia Gregory, finance department. Danny Bajan, finance. Jonathan Gomez, mayor's office. Thank you. Um, you may proceed with your presentation. On the uh, the uh, list for the schedule that we uh, gave you, showing the uh, different years of uh, budget that the uh, office has, uh, the uh, the increase. If you take a look at it from 1.2 again to 1. Point, I mean, they're all in the same ballpark until we have been 2022 for a 1.4 million in the uh, in the budget. The uh, the increase that we are requesting for this year is about the, uh, the additional money that we need for the appraisal, the additional money we need for the uh, assessing aid. And uh, the uh, the overtime money more than what we spent last year. If you tell, take a look at the functional chart, that we have on the other page, page four. This is how the uh, the staff uh, of the office is uh, distributed. Mostly we have assistant assessors that uh, work with the, of course, with the assessing function. That includes uh, the, uh, the defense of appeals between the uh, county level and the state uh, level. Sorry, uh, can I hold on one second? Okay. The, uh, the, the next page basically. One second, one second uh, Ed, sorry, uh, Director, excuse me. Director, to can I ask a quick question? I see in the org chart at the bottom, it lists a date. It says March 8th, 2023. Is that the most updated org chart? Uh, yes, it is. There, are, there hasn't been any change yet. Okay. And is that true of all the, you know, as for the administration, is that true of all the org charts? Or are these the ones the most updated that we're getting? Mayor's office actually has um, updated organizational charts, which Jonathan could probably share. OK, I just saw the March date on this, so that was just a little surprise. If you if you take a look at the uh, the color. Wait, hold on one second, Ed, sorry. Councilman, um, for the orchard for the tax assessors, we haven't had the meeting yet, but we will. Um, I will reach out to Jayla that we can schedule it. Uh, we will provide you with an updated one. OK, great, thanks. 
And if you need for the other departments, just please submit a request and we'll go. OK, great. Thank you. We have a uh, different uh, color coding that we have on the uh, table of organization. The uh, the titles of the other positions that they're requesting were intended for this uh, year's uh, budget. Uh, we intend to uh, hire uh, for assessing aid. Uh, the basic functions uh, all on this title would be doing uh, site in inspections. Uh, right mm -hmm. now we only have uh, one inspector basically for the entire city and uh, the inspector basically is the is the individual where information is gathered uh, from uh, from the field any information or, or uh, data being collected and then it, it is interpreted into uh, into and converted into uh, set values so the more uh, fieldmen we have the better for us to uh, get uh, to uh, acquire more uh, readables out there. Of course, more readable uh, converts to a lower uh, tax rate. A director. So I wanted to ask how long have we only had one inspector for? And I remember having a meeting. Well, we'll start with that question first. How long have we only had one inspector? And then. Well, when the assessing it was transferred to another division, we had uh, two, and when we had one transferred, so that basically. Uh, uh, Hold on one second. Sorry about that. I accidentally I pressed it. Just, just hang tight. <laughs> it never fails. It never fails. So basically, with the, with the two inspectors that we have going. Uh, in the field that was uh, reduced uh, to one. I, I, I apologize for being late, yeah. but uh, if you can hold off a second, yes. I can't hear you with the yeah. screen coming down. That's why we said. <laughs> if you don't mind holding off, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sounds like a buzzsaw. Is it going back up? Is it going back up? message from our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. It's going to make a loud noise once it gets up there. Ooh, OK. No, it's going back down. Oh, no, it's going up. It's going up. OK. <laughs> Some oil chains. I promise I won't hit it again. I don't feel safe over here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. OK, OK, beautiful. We are we good. can hear you, director. Uh, I said we want up to basically just having one inspector for the entire city. I hate to make a comparison between uh, our office and other departments that uh, send people out in the field. Uh, one thing you're talking about building department. If you just want to take a look at uh, the uh, the inspectors or field people they have, I think uh, they have over over 20 over 20 individuals that are out basically looking at these new constructions or uh, uh, new uh, development renovations on properties where permit is issued, and they would have to. Uh, follow up through, you know, in order for them to close the uh, the permits. If you could just take that number and just put a ratio like 50% or that, uh, at least you should have uh, 10 inspectors from the uh, for the assessor's office. Uh, not necessarily a one to one correspondent to this uh, individual that are out uh, in the uh, in the field, but in order for us to gather more information and be able to uh, uh, get more readables, I think Additional field people are uh, are required. I don't know if I got an answer to the question. How long have we had only one inspector for? I would say uh, months. We got two for the longest time, and then one year when we have just one year. Okay. And 
we had a meeting earlier in the year regarding commandeering or uh, recruiting construction code officials to assist with the tax assessor's office and to sort of train them when they go and do their um, what's it called site inspections, right? Um, where are we in that process and have they begun to assist your office with those inspections and helping your office get accurate assessments? We had a meeting with our building department. Uh, this is basically the vision that we're looking forward to get some uh, help because they got uh, more uh, skilled uh, people. We gave them the uh, the the form on the, what to gather out there. And uh, from what I understand, the uh, building division is looking at to integrate this with uh, the Tyler uh, program. So until now, we're not getting uh, any feedback as to uh, any uh, data collected from the uh, the schedule or from the uh, the form that we gave to uh, the division. So there was only one meeting regarding the integration of both that's the construction correct. code and tax. OK, yeah, according to the uh, director of the division that it is much easier if they can, if that uh, form that we gave to to them can be integrated into Tyler, so it would be automatically populated. All they need to do then is confirm it, uh, confirming it from the uh, site. Uh, this is to the administration. Yeah. Um, why haven't we enlisted the construction code officials to help out the tax assessor's office? Um, if I feel like we're leaving money on the table um, and if we're. Is the BA here? Because I know some of you guys wasn't in the meeting when we had that discussion and um, we don't want to just, you know, ask you guys and you really don't know. The BA and them was in the meeting when we discussed that and, and that was supposed to be a plan because at the time we couldn't hire. So um, that's why. And uh, he's saying now they just had a conversation and based on what I'm understanding with the conversation you had with them, they just going to see if they can upload this type of, uh, I guess, uh, sheet or questionnaire into Tyler. But Tyler is a new system that I mean, it, it, it's going to be we're not going to get this information right away because of Tyler, because everybody's learning it now. So, Council President, the meeting that you had wasn't the finance committee meeting where we met. Right. Are you talking about that meeting or was right. it a subsequent meeting? No, we're talking about that meeting when we did the okay. meeting mm -hmm. before no. this year, and that was the conversation where we had with outside of the meeting that we had earlier this year where it was there was no additional meeting. No. OK. Um, and I think representing from the BA's office was Peter Horton, correct? Let me see if we can get Peter um, here. It is news to me that out of that oh, no, right. thing changed because we walked away from that meeting that they were supposed to be working together. Correct. So if there's something that happened, I would have to say that the assessor and the uh, then director who offered their services for clarity and ask them that question. When HEDC comes in, they'll have to answer for that as well. Um, but I just feel like there's no sense of urgency between the administration, the department, even on the council. I'll take blame. Like you know, it doesn't happen through osmosis. We have to we have to act with urgency. Oh, so. and we um, can he rather just hire another um, inspector. Do we have any inspectors in the pipeline? Because based on this conversation, I'm quite sure the building department, their hands are filled. That's why they're not taking on this responsibility. And it just seemed like, OK, it was just a casual conversation. We'll see if we can upload it in Tyler. You know, there's no urgency there. But yet, you know, we are missing a lot of money on the table here. So it is an urgency if we just hire someone. Maybe that might be the best thing instead of waiting. Right, so out of that meeting, the action items for finance were to fund additional hires, which we have in this proposed budget. There's four vacancies to date. No one's been hired. I don't know where the department's at in their process of interviewing candidates or 
any other thing of that nature, but we did fund four additional hires for them. Okay. And that was really the only action we could have taken at gotcha. that time. So, so, so the director's responsibility to run that department. I, 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 at this point, you know, we've been through this so, so often. And director, if you know that you're missing money on the table, to be perfectly honest, okay, it's your responsibility to kind of sound the alarm. To be perfectly honest, it's your responsibility to sound the alarm to make sure you have enough help. If you're not getting that help, if 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 it is a breakdown in HR, whatever the case is, because it seems like every time we come to somebody, the breakdown is in HR, like something that has not been done. All right. So if that's the case, then you need to go up a little higher. There's a mayor over here who runs all these departments. If you're not getting what you want, you need to meet with him because we're missing money on the table because at this point, I'm quite sure the residents are frustrated because the taxes are too high. But maybe if we can gather enough revenue, we won't have to keep going up on these taxes. But it's your responsibility as the director to make sure these things are done. I, 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 at this point, we can stop making excuses. It's the director's department. It's the director's responsibility to get it done. If you're not, then you have to sound the alarm. We don't know. There's a question. Um... Well, if if he wants to answer council president first, okay, and then you want to respond in case they're the um, council president. I don't yeah. think uh, we are in any way uh, lacking in terms of sounding the alarm. OK, I mean that we always either send uh, uh, emails to the uh, BA and to uh, the budget. The good thing that happened now, although it's not on an expeditious way, HR has uh, posted the uh, the job uh, you know uh, titles into the uh, civil service uh, website, so hopefully we'll be able to hire uh, four people. Um, I know, uh, so for my knowledge, I know that the mayor did approve those hires. I know finance made a recommendation, so those hires should be approved. And for now, you CC me on the emails. That way, I'm aware of the needs for your department. Just, just to follow up what you say, Councilwoman, um, this issue has been happening for so many years, I would say, that we're looking for inspectors. Um, we couldn't hire before because it was an issue with the budget. So like a month or so, they give us OK to hire assessing aides. So I, uh, we work out with HR, so they posted a job. Yesterday, they forward to us the resumes because I follow up to the emails. It didn't say it didn't forward to me, so I had to be keeping following up to send me the resume. So yesterday, I follow up, they forward to me like at least eight or ten resumes that we need to set up an appointment okay um, and then um okay. interviews okay so now we're in the process so based on the interviews that you're going to do i'm just trying to get the timeline here because this is urgent and, and i know a lot of times i find out the ball is dropped because even with certain things i deal with i'm thinking certain things are going on this person ain't communicating, this other person is waiting, and then you have to come back to square one and start this over. And they say, oh, well, I didn't know, oh, they didn't speak to me, they didn't communicate with me. I just want to know a timeline on, because this is an urgency. We were trying to do, do this. For you can hire somebody, how long it take, two weeks, three weeks? I mean, hopefully if everything goes well and you know they're okay with the salary, because the salary is a big thing also, because you need to make at least higher than the than the regular hour to be able to be in inspections outside. So it's a lot of it's our salary is a problem. You you know the salaries that you posted. Now you yes. tell me about the salary. Is our salaries compatible? It, it is. I mean, that's basically the cap that they give us HR. We're trying to go a little bit higher because again, it's a kind of minimal salary that we posted outside, and I probably that's the reason why because we tried to hire last year also. And they didn't work because we assumed that was because of the salary. But now actually, you think the salary is is acceptable? That that's all I want. My to point of view, no, no, no. Okay, what do we have to do to get that salary acceptable? I mean, if I mean the maybe office. we can't. Maybe we can't hire four, but maybe we can hire three if we up the salary. Could that be done? Yeah, that's basically what we have in four hires. Um, um, also, just to add this up, uh, we overpass the overtime because we have so many appeals in the county. Right. Also, again, since we have less inspectors, we need to go outside more to be able to kind of catch up with whatever we have before. So the people who actually can work overtime, there are few assessors. So that's why that's um, the overtime went up, like actually more than what we requested. Um, and according to the budget office, they're trying to cut um, like maybe two hires to be able for us to use some overtime this year. 
because again, we have close to 3,000 appeals for this year. We have over 2,600 tax court cases. And it, even if that's besides any permits, COs, site plan approvals, any, I put those in the side. We need a lot of overtime, at least until we hire an inspector to be able well, to well, cover. Well, maybe, maybe let's 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 try to hire somebody. But that's what I'm saying. So to hire somebody at this point, like at least it would take a, like a month, I would say, to a get month. approval and everything. To train somebody, you still need at least like a few like weeks a month because you cannot send somebody outside without even having a knowledge of what they're doing. So give or take, I would say three months. But in the meantime, we will ask you to help us also trying to or some people, my my assessors and inspector, to have extra overtime to be able to I cover know, until we the, hire somebody. I know, based on what finance is telling me, we're only going to be able to do one or the other. So I I do have huh? a question, but Sean has asked me to wait. Madam President, I is it so if I can just mark Council Person Prince Airy present at 2.48 p.m. So now we have five council members present at 2.48 p.m. So I did come in late and I apologize if this question has already been raised, but um, for other divisions, they will sometimes contract out to catch up on work. I know we've done it within our other, like, like for the parks department, for example, for the law department, for example, when they were doing the appeals in court, is there a way to do that to help in the catch up while we're waiting to hire people? Um, because I think that that, that may be a possible band-aid in the meantime to get you all caught up as you're going through the hiring process. When the uh, idea surfaced about outsourcing the inspections, so we budgeted like 50,000 uh, for the, uh, the cost of outsourcing inspections from either a local realtor or a local uh, brokers. I think what happened with the budget this year, that 50,000 was knocked out from the uh, from the budget item that we have. Uh, Council so, President, you mentioned so, about so the time. Uh, yeah, just okay. But I would like a follow up to why that money was knocked out. If there is urgency and there has been urgency. I, I could address that. So the additional request for the assessor's office this year was 50,000 for professional services and an extra 20,000 for overtime on top of five new hires. We made the determination to fund four new hires. Okay. So that's about 130, $140,000 of additional funding from last year's budget that we allocated to the assessor's office. Keeping in mind that we requested all departments to submit budget cuts the assessor's office was one area which we increased. It's a minimal amount, but is what we were able to fund this year, especially without a track record of success of hiring new assessors, right? Uh, assessing aides. If if it yields positive results for the finance department and the budget, it, I think in future years we can continue down that route, route of bringing on more and more assessors. But right now it's a decision between the council and the assessor's office on how they want to reallocate that funding because year to date they've already exceeded their $30,000 overtime budget, which we didn't cut. We cut overtime budgets across the city, kept their budget overtime budget flat, hoping with the addition of the new assessors, we could maintain the same level of service as we did in prior years. Obviously we want to improve that, but we didn't cut their overtime budget. We didn't fund fully what they asked for because we made concessions in giving those four new hires. So that that was the decision we made as finance department. You know, we were happy with the results last year from the assessment committee, and we really realized how valuable um, that function is uh, overall. So mm -hmm. that's the decision that we took. So if the council wants to make amendments to this, again, I would just caution that we we don't want to increase taxes anymore. These are minimal changes, and we'll entertain them. And then at the end of all our hearings, we'll bring it back to you. If if you want to add the four hires additional professional services, additional overtime, it's going to come at a cost and cuts to other other areas. So uh, they have at least four of them. They have at least four that they can hire. We funded four. Right now they're trending to go over their overtime for the year. So we need to cover that overtime as well. So there are. Right. So what about if they hire three? I and then that, 
that refs can cover some of the overtime. I'm just asking. Uh, that's totally reasonable, and okay. we've seen that in other areas. Uh, right now, where the way the trend is going, they'll have enough funding for two of the four. Got you. At the current rate of overtime. At if the current can, rate of the overtime that they, you get, so it's only manage, two. If they can manage to curb overtime, and I want to say only go over 39,000, which is reasonable, then they can hire three. But we need to see that that trend come down before we got you on that. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Prinzeri, did you have any questions anymore? Ridley? So, okay. so I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I think that this right. is worth further discussion, maybe outside of this budget hearing to do some analysis also to see if it makes sense to do a slightly different course correct. If there is the urgency that I'm hearing that there is to get us caught up and what might make sense now or when you first worked on the budget, like, I just think it's worth further conversation outside of this meeting. And, you know, uh, the people of this city are tired of the taxes that are being placed upon us. Actually, it's your responsibility now to go after whoever you have to to get these inspectors. Because there are a million buildings, especially downtown, and exchange place that are under assessed. And I'm a homeowner, and so are they. And we're tired of the taxes. We're tired of the one in four families are tired of subsidizing these big buildings. And you know what I'm talking about. They're, they're under assessed. They have to be assessed. And ha this BS has got to stop. Councilman Solomon. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I just had a couple of technical questions. Just on, on the overtime issue, who, who, how does that get approved? Does Is it just purely to the department or, or is there, does finance get, get, get a say? Approval. How does that work? Over time, over time is approved at the department. So the department, and, and if there's an over expenditure, how is that addressed? Well, um, the council's received a few notices Reports. from yeah. myself. Uh, we send the same notice to the department director and the business administrator in hopes that it's addressed and we continue to monitor and advise. And in this case this year, we've been providing them with the corrective action that we're going to have to take. In this instance, I've notified Ed and Laura, that we're going to have to cut two hires if we continue at this trend. And I believe they pause overtime for the year. But again, we have no authority on approving or denying any overtime. And back to our finance department's meeting this this morning, we have to see what the results are at the end of the year. And eventually, if these are deferred over expenditures, it's a deferred charge in the next year's budget. Right. Okay. And and then you know, did want to echo the council president's point, you know, which is. You know, the 40 K salary for the the aides is low and, you know, if there's an ability to work with HR and, and ultimately if you end up, you, you end up exactly what the council president said, you end up with three instead of four, or maybe because of the OT you end up with two instead of three. You know, it's also a way to you, know, you hire somebody and, and they're at that salary and then the next year they're somewhere else, you know, and, and if HR is the roadblock that gets to the, the exact point the council president was making of making us aware, making the administration aware to say, OK, like let's let's problem solve and 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 fix that. So I just wanted to you know echo her point there because I thought it was you know really important for us. I uh, don't think the construction code officials are off the hook. Even three inspectors or four isn't going to make a dent. They need the the administration. You guys need to follow up on this because this is insane. We need to make sure construction code officials are doing the. The work that you guys need in the tax assessor's office. It's a redundancy of effort. If I had 20 tax assessors and then 20 construction or code officials, they all need to be working together. Yes, we need more tax assessors, but construction code officials, if they're on the site, they should be doing it. And that I'm just going to leave it at that. And you may continue your presentation. I want to. I'm sorry. Ed. Just give me one second. I'm sorry. So. Councilperson Ridley arrived at 3.04 p.m., so we now have six council members present at 3.04. Go ahead, Ed. The, uh, the last conversation I had with the uh, building division uh, through uh, Ray Meyer, I uh, requested uh, him that the information that they would be gathering would be moving forward because that's the only time they would be in the field basically doing the inspections and everything. So they can incorporate the data. They could populate those fields without, uh, you know, uh, addressing anything backwards that an issue uh, a CEO already. Uh, I told him that we will be addressing the permits that were already issued and the certificate of occupancies. 
there is no way for them to go back to the same site they were or that they inspected before. So hopefully, you know, moving forward, they will be able to provide us that uh, the uh, the data that we were looking for. In answer to the council president uh, in terms of how expedient can we hire this uh, assessing aid, I think uh, I don't know when the uh, the uh, job opening would be closed. So hopefully by June and then July we could uh, have uh, three or four assessing aids on board. Within that time period, we could train them in a month in a less than a month, and they would be able to go out on their own. Now, the uh, the the office goes into what you call the three uh, cycles. You have October, which is basically we file what you call the other uh, assessment, and then the January, that's the regular assessment for the entire city. It, the period in between is the defense of appeals. Right now we are addressing the uh, the appeals that were filed before the county and before before the uh, the tax court. Hopefully by August, September, October till December, this uh, new hires would be able to gather information in time for us to get the uh, the numbers into the books for 2024. And hopefully, you know, through the help of the uh, building division, we'll be able to get uh, more information. Thank you. Oh yeah, uh, Council President. OK, I, I just want clarity because uh, we do need to be clear how we're going to move forward with getting them help. That That's what I want clarity. Um, so you 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 have you have the ability to hire four. She told us about overtime based on what finance is saying if because they really exceeded their overtime. So if they want to continue with overtime, then they only going to be able to hire two. Is that correct? At the current rate, yes. The current rate that they're going. Yeah, we'll continue to update them okay. biweekly when payroll is available. So then maybe what we need to do is just start with two. I think the only reason why I'm saying that because based on what Laura's saying is that to catch up, you need the overtime, right? That's what you're saying. There's no question. So then if that's the case, then and we can't do it all, but we have to do something to get this department up and, and, and run it because we're missing a lot of revenue. So why can't we shoot for the two and then this way here kind of monitor their overtime? If finance is prepared to approve two today or tomorrow whenever it comes through and we'll continue to monitor the, the trend and well, we will prioritize this in an amendment if there's something that comes up in other department hearings where there's no longer funding needed. To fulfill their full ask, it's about. Oh, let's just stick with that. So, let's, yeah. let's stick with that. We don't know what another department going to need. Right. We can all walk out here with a clear conscience that we know we should be supposed to have at least two more, and we do have something in the in the cookie box, whatever you want to call it, for the overtime just in case. That that's it. And and if y'all exceed that, then you can't get no more overtime, <laughs> right? Okay, that's it. That's that we need clarity uh, because I mean the people are watching and what are we doing? We're missing a lot of revenue. We need the inspectors out here. So we need to just make a decision when we have these budget hearings instead of saying, okay, we're gonna what else are we gonna do? The public need to know what we're doing. We're clear. Everybody? Y'all clear with yeah. the two? Yep. Uh, uh it will be clearer once I get the answer uh, on my question. Uh, uh, no, we just uh, we just want to be clear on the hiring first. All, all what I'm saying is that we 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 stopped the overtime right now when I got the alert that we exceeded already our budget. Okay. Now, because y'all exceeded it, that's why. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, right now before the county tax board, the uh, we won't be able to address this without the additional time. So what happens is that a lot of postponements are being uh, requested to the county tax board to address them in the in the future. If we have additional time, probably it would lessen the request for postponements on this hearing. Now you may ask how come you're working throughout the year from day one, January one to all the way all the way to December. The thing is, it's a little bit complex in terms of what numbers or how can you do numbers? Uh, there is always what you call the kicker date, which is October 1. 
before before October 1, what we do is we gather all the information, you do the analysis, and then the county promulgates what you call the, the ratio. October 10, the ratio comes out. The state says, Mr. Tax Assessor, for 2024, you assess properties, say, at 95% of their market value. Anything higher or lower th than that would be subject to the uh, the appeal. Now, one of the reasons why we have a surge in this appeal for this year, well, one thing, it is very obvious that because of the tax rate that went up, because when uh, John Smith gets an additional bill from the bank, he doesn't have any idea, you know, just how can one, you know, and then you get all this blog mail from the attorneys, you file an appeal, whether there are chances or not, so they just file the appeal. Thank you. Can you go? Oh, do you have to, no, uh, Councilman? You got to turn your microphone on. Yeah, this is just a repeat of 2022. And it's senseless. If we're sitting up here and we're talking now and nothing's going to be done, we're just wasting our time. So get them the inspectors and let's get it over with. Because the taxpayers are tired of what's going on in this city. Okay. Sorry, I think Phil was the representative from from the meeting that we was at too. Phil was was there too because I remember you was asking who else. Peter, uh, Peter Orion, correct? Yeah. So Peter was supposed to be here, but unfortunately he um is uh, had a had a family member that passed away. So we're just oh. I'm connecting with the BA's office uh, to see who else is going to. Um, but I think Council overall globally we did our best in trying to make them whole with some of the systemic issues with this, this Aaron department out of the outcomes of last year. We are tracking, we are reporting, we're sending you the reports, you know, things that we have to do in finance from like if there's overtimes and things to that nature and to um, Councilman Mira's point, I think this does take a deeper dive, right? You've heard from finance what we need to do for the budget. You heard from the law department of what we're doing with the ad assessment and the attorneys. And now you're hearing from this area that globally has to be drilled down. So I don't think it is going to be solved here and it is going to continue to be in perpetuity because the purpose of today is to talk about budget structure, order operations, expectations. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, and it, it's hard. And you know that I chaired up the committee figuring out our values and figuring out the strategies, providing what our goals are. And my goal is to work with this office, understanding that it is an independent office, right? They are an independent office. I'm asking them to show us the math and I'm asking them to show us the operations and we'll figure out those policy details along the way. That is a goal and objective of, of finance so that we'll be able to provide that clarity so that you can be able to provide the information that you need back to, to the public. Thank you. Director, you may proceed with your uh, presentation. Yeah, I think we discussed the uh, the uh, most vital issues for the office, the new hires, the uh, the overtime, and uh, is this uh, tax exempt properties? Oh yes, yes. We were, yeah. But basically, uh, if you look at page five of the slides, we have. Is the distribution of our uh, rateable right now? Uh, one thing, one thing that we have accomplished from 2022 to 2023 is that we were able to raise the rateable by uh, by three uh, three billion, and that uh, transformed into like you know maybe around 65 million in there. But again, also the problem is about uh, the uh, the amount that we need to raise. You look about uh, the amount we raised from last year to this year. There's no question that the bill we have from the Board of Education, basically, and you know, a lot of people can that be sustained because the, the every every amount that we have would uh, contribute to the increase in the uh, the tax rate. Right now, I think approximately what was added is like 78 million uh, from the uh, the bill we got from the Board of Ed last year into this year. So um, can you explain that uh, now that you open the door about the Board of Ed, our tax is going to increase on their end and by how much? 
Right now, with the additional bill that we have, I think the uh, calculations we have from 2.118, like 2.12 or 2.15. Give me that as a percent. Like, a little. I know that. How much uh, would that? Imp I don't have the the numbers yet to uh, compute what would be the perspective projected uh, tax rate would be. One, one, can one, have that. one thing, one thing, the county, I think the county budget uh, has never been introduced yet, so we don't know just how much increase they would have. On their budget. The board has had approved their budget, I believe, last week. The board, the board of Ed levy, not the full. Uh, yeah. Rate. How much is the board of Ed levy? From 352 to 430 million. Okay, and and when it's inquired on this, we you confirmed this was about 13 percent increase for the year, right? You just need confirmation on on that for the council. Right, the assumption that uh, I know we added like 5 percent on the, uh, the projected budgets we have on the other uh, revenue accounts, but one thing sometimes that does not hold true because we don't know what the budget is for the uh, the county. Can I, can I ask, sorry, uh, when you said it increased from roughly 350 to 400 million, is, is that the calendar year 2023 versus calendar year 2022, or is that a fiscal year calculation? Basically from 352 to 430, 2022 bill to 2023. That's how much we're gonna pay for this uh, budget year. Okay. In what rate, were we using for the first and second quarter uh, for the schools in in the first and second quarter of 2023? Every every first and second quarter is always derived from 50% of the total building we had from last year. If you have 1,000 uh, total bill for 2022, your first and second quarter of 2023 would be 250, 250, that's 500. Now, if it so happened, the tax rate goes up and it becomes 1200. So 1200 minus 500, then that's your balance of the third and fourth quarter. That's how, how the first and second yeah. quarter is derived at. Because I think it would uh, potentially maybe the issue here, right, is that obviously because the schools had such a large increase last year that, you know, we were we were basing the first and second quarter of the city bill or the total bill, I should say, um, based off of the calendar year 2022, um, but obviously they increased a ton starting in the third quarter of, of 2022. Do, in the future, do we have discretion over how we set that first and second quarter bill? Um, so could could we, you know, kind of saying, we know that this, the, the school's tax levy is gonna be higher because we know they increased taxes in, you know, the start of the fiscal year. So we so so then we wouldn't have to increase because we you know we're gonna actually have a, the third quarter bill is gonna have a, at least some increase in it. The 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 billing basically is set by statute. Statute, okay. And there's no the first the half is basically one half of last year's. Could we apply for a waiver or go to the local finance board? Uh, I don't know if uh, you know, the budget would be able to. You know. Okay. Okay. So we don't know exactly how much taxes are going to go up from the Board of Ed, essentially. Or I'm trying to. I think I think it's in the county, so we no. can't set the bill. I, I think we're going to have to do some investigation. So I don't know if this is 100 percent true, but I think what happened here is it was a calendar year versus fiscal year issue. So I don't think the Board of Ed raised taxes from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23. I think it was whatever flat or slightly reduced, but because we're based on the calendar year, it did increase this calendar year, which is why the third quarter bill had to go up. Um, that's that's why I'm deducing. Okay. All right. What's this uh, 15A uh, for the taxes of properties? What does that mean? Sorry. Uh, page five. I just it's a large gray slice. Yeah, these are the uh, the churches. Oh, churches, right? Okay. All right, we won't bother them. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are other exemptions also included in here. It's just that it's so happened that those are not exempt in the literal meaning of exemption. These are the abated properties that we have. We we call them, we class them like 15F. So uh, we include that as part of the 
total rateable distribution. Now, uh, it is still surprising in spite of the fact that we had the COVID the years and post COVID, the, uh, the, the volume of uh, transfers is still going up in the, in the city as evidence from uh, 2020, uh, 21, 22, and rightly, you know, we're talking about uh, until, well, this year it's only partial. What's the significance of that for your office? The transfer of property or the number of deeds I see you have, you know, well, the, this as a graph, like why is the why should we care? It is still the, in other words, the uh, the people have still a positive outlook of what the real estate would look like with the city from year on, in spite of the fact that either we have increased interest, interest rates, but nevertheless, their calculations is that with the cost of ownership going high, nevertheless, the uh, the amount of uh, real estate appreciation is still greater. You go over the department goals for us. Yeah, well, we set up like a minimum goal. Like, for instance, if you if you have an additional 1.5 billion, I think that's the the safest way of setting up goal on how much rateable you'd be able to raise. Uh, normally, you, you work more than that goal. You want to surpass the uh, the uh, objective that you have for the year, and many times we, we come up with that objective. Have we bought the laptop or the that we wanted or the iPad? The latest is that they actually order Lenovo tablets by IT, but I didn't receive it. I have an email back in two weeks ago that Vivek ordered a few tablets for the entire city and he added 10 tablets for my department. So I'm still waiting for them, but he said that he posted, uh, he posted an order already. Do you know when they're going to arrive? Or? No idea. The last time that I follow up with the email, he told me that he ordered a few for the entire city and he added 10 for the tax assessor. This is the which department? IT. Uh, IT. Okay. All right, we'll follow up with IT. Yes, I will. Fa actually, that's how I know because I follow up and he told me he ordered them already. So I don't know if, if they are right, but I will follow up tomorrow. Yeah. I'm looking at the things that haven't been achieved, increasing inspections. We've spoken about that and optimizing. OK. Um, any questions for my council colleagues regarding slide seven? Twenty twenty three goals. OK, uh, seeing none. Permits and CEOs from 2020 to 2023. Just to, to uh, reiterate basically the need for additional uh, field people. Uh, any any permits actually an open permit. There is a need for the office to get out of there. It doesn't necessarily mean that you could add 100,000 on the rateable or you could add uh, 500,000 depending on the location because on certain uh, renovations, you figure out what would be the return value of a dollar invested in the property. Would that transform or convert it into another $10 out of a dollar invested? Of course, it is a given. If you spend something into the property, you're looking forward to get it back more than what you spend. Now, uh, in Jersey City, a lot of times you get the permits for X, but if you get to inspect it, what you get there is the alphabet. <laughs> you got they they do this, they they have done that. They, it's almost like total you know total renovations, where in fact the permit only shows like kitchen you know or a bathroom. Uh, I think that's one area that we need also to uh, uh, stress out with uh, the building to uh, 
basically, you know, include the amount, the total project cost on the on the building, because the things we have to accept that some houses when they do the renovation, say in the downtown where you have brownstones, the quality of materials is entirely different when you have a frame house. It could be a kitchen, could be made up for mica, while on the other hand, you have uh, marbles. That's why it is important for the, the cost. You may say, what does the cost uh, mean in terms of valuation? It varies because, as I said, if I build a 600,000 worth of a house and the return value is 1.2 million, and then you have somebody who built, say, 500, and the return value is a million. So right there and there, you could extrapolate the ratio between the cost and the uh, the return value. That's why I think it is imperative for whoever issues the permits and COs to at least uh, you know give us the uh, the the cost in doing those renovations. This is even aside from the ones where the uh, the property owner we just you just catch them, they have a truck there, they, they don't have a dumpster permit that you could have this uh, paper trail. So what you do then, you just have to wait for three or four months and then you ask for inspection on that property and uh, voila, then you'll be able to, you, you could just see that renovations have been done, the paperwork. Can we go over uh, slide nine with the 2022-2023 budget changes? regarding the professional services, can you? Um, you know, I see that's where the bulk of the change from 2022 to 2023 um, heard. Can you go over what professional services have you, you guys used to date? What has it reaped for the city in terms of benefits and what's there left to do? Uh, the the areas that were included uh, here are the appraisers. Normally, would have two appraisers on board uh, where the contract is like thirty five thousand e. This year, because of the volume of the appeals we have and the high end volume or high end value of properties that are before the tax court, there is a need for more appraisal reports as required by the uh, the tax court. So we increase them for 35 to 75 each so that alone you're looking you're looking at uh was that 75 minus 35 was that 50 or 70 yeah they did that's the, that's the difference and then on the uh the tax map update uh before what happened was Tyler was incorporated in the initial uh, installation the fee for this and then also moving forward we still carry around like a maintenance uh, kind of uh, uh, service I think that accounts for additional six uh, six thousand any questions for my council colleagues okay um and let's see the budget change of justification. I think you went over the overtime wages. We beat that. You know. Do you have anything else you'd like to add about that? Uh, well, in terms of overtime, I don't know if we have now the, the green light, although the money would be coming from a different revenue account, whether if there is a need for overtime, we can, you know, uh, allow uh, people uh, to uh, overtime moving forward. Do you have a position on uh, rolling assessments throughout the city, and how could we accomplish that? The uh, the ideal way of uh, doing this rolling assessment is have a reval. After the reval, the following year will have the rolling assessment. So every year, basically, we have a different. Uh, you, you could put everything under the hundred percent of uh, market value. We so have. We should have a baseline, though. The baseline would be when everything in the city is up to one hundred percent of market value. It is much easier then to move forward for the following year to have this rolling 
rolling assessments. The last time we had a a, um, a, a reval was in 2018, correct? 2018, yes. So we would have to have another one in order to do a rolling assessment. That, that's uh, that's correct. Yeah. You may ask, is there is it justified to have a a, a reval? Well, one one criteria basically when your ratio pulls below 85, basically that's another that's a way of gauging where the reval is needed. And now we are at 82.91 percent. We are at 82.91. Oh, well, so the ideal is question. never below 85. Okay. Uh, I see a request for the wearing of apparel. Do you guys have that? That'll be addressed. That's just an oversight on our part. We'll make sure anyone that we hire has the proper uniforms uh, in accordance with their bargaining agreement. Do you guys want to go over anything on this sheet? Um, what is the, the last few pages in the blue spreadsheet? Oh, I see. Well, the, the thing is uh, what we requested that we were able to justify. Uh, I know you might be able to uh, go around some of the budget items we have since we're almost in the middle of the year and the budget that they're requesting is for the entire year, probably temporarily if the, the budget would uh, agree, the budget office would, or finance would agree with us that basically we could, I don't know if we could transfer some money to cover some of the shortfall we have on some of our budget items. Okay. Any questions from council colleagues? A question that we'd asked the budget office this morning was, um, have you seen a number of appeals from the commercial real estate on the waterfront? Um, and if so, how much of our rateable base might we be in uh, danger of, of losing or, or seeing a reduction as the value of kind of commercial real estate has declined you know, nationwide? I, uh, I do not have the number, but based on some of the pending uh, uh, negotiations or settlements we have. Uh, COVID years, especially the uh, offices, commercial uh, properties in the waterfront area suffered uh, a lot, uh, including uh, hotels. Uh, sometimes one thing, you know, during the COVID years, they don't even have an occupancy. And uh, as part of our negotiation, of course, they get the benefit for the COVID year and little by little, once we know that the stream of income they have has been shown the stability, then we could always go back and revisit them for say 23 or 24. They may get the relief for the COVID years and depending on their occupancy rate, we could revisit 23 and 24. There's no question about that, that uh, commercial properties in what, the area. Have, have we seen a number of people? What about the, I understand the hotels. What about the office space? Yeah, that's the thing. They all commercial basically suffered. Right. Uh, from the from the owner's perspective, based on our conversation, right. they were saying there were uh, tenants that uh, did not renew their leases, or even if they renewed, they're using smaller spaces. Sure. I guess that makes sense. Can we try to kind of quantify what what is at stake here? You know, how much might we end up spending you know, losing in appeals? Um, you know, how much might the rateable base decline? I just is that something uh, we can do? Yeah, we will see our records and go back, even depending once that we might be a be uh, settling. What how much exposure do we have? Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Hey, John, uh, from the mayor's office. Take your time. Now I see why <laughs> John struggles so much. Uh, regarding the tablets, Joe's email me. Vivek told me that you need to approve the order and that he will place and get it delivered to you guys. Okay. 
anything further from my council colleagues. Uh, any last words, uh, director? Just want to add something quick. Uh, are we OK putting the overtime now? Just double check because what's not OK. Think. So if we want to increase the overtime, it has to go to council approval for an amendment. Again, what we said earlier, as the budget stands, funding for your new hires is covering your projected deficit and overtime. So let's hire people first and if we have to. Yes. Yeah. Two. Yeah, I, I just ask him because we still working in that tax appeals in the county. So, so far we have appeals up to um, the end of June. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a hands up is for every case we have like 80 to 75 to 80 cases per calendar. So one assessor has to review all of them, at least three compatibles per property. So it's a lot of work. So we kind of been postponing because we don't have enough time to review all those cases, especially since you mentioned waterfront properties. When you give us an appraisal for those buildings, we're talking about leases, appraisals that it's not easy to do in one day. So it's impossible to do a review for appraisals or leases in those buildings. So I just want to let you know that we'll be postponing a bunch of cases. We might be moving to July of August for county appeals. So far we have, well, for the whole year is 2,856 county appeals. We don't even counting the tax court cases that we have for many years. So we really need the overtime for the assessors to be able to work in those cases. So that's why I was asking if it's okay for us to put the overtime back for at least cover the county appeals for at least two months until we hire somebody to work in the inspection, which is a different area. But the objective was let's hire the two first. Yeah, yeah. As it stands, the more overtime they do, the less hires they get. Right. Yeah. That's why we said two two hires. Yeah. That's it. Two hires. Yeah. Typically, departments don't spend their full overtime budget in the right. first quarter. That's of the what year. they're concerned about finance. I see their concern. Yeah, I understand where they're coming from, but if you see how much money we spend in the last year. And I mean, we can prove where the money is going because again, we have so many appeals that it's not easy to work in one day. And I mean, if you want to see the numbers, how much appeals we have every day, we'll be happy to share with you. But again, if you check how much money we spent in the last year, it's more than what you actually budget for this year. I understand that it's cut in the budget, but I think we had to allocate money where it is needed. And especially when we're dealing with rateables and the city is looking for money, I think it is departments that need more attention than others in regarding with rateables. Go ahead, Carmen. <laughs> so I was going to say, oh, Carmen, yep, uh, director, excuse me. So um, I think, Ed and Laura, I think finance is the receivership. If there's an additional ask, we understand we set the mandate about trying to balance the budget and projected cuts. We're now in the second quarter of this year. If you anticipate that there are going to be changes later on to proceed, now is the time to submit what you asked. This morning, the law department came in. They had prepared a budget in December, right? Because we have to do what we need to do. Um, and they asked specific things. If you were articulating and saying, I'm not going to make the operations at the rate that I'm going, tell us the number, tell the council the number so that we can all figure it out together. So if you're saying the four hires to two, like if we're, we said to start off with four hires, we go now doing it too. She blows that budget. Then I have to come back and in, and in, in December, and we've gone over it, and now it's not there. So I think this is your opportunity to come back and present an amended budget as they're going to the hearings. You're going to have to do it sooner rather than later because we'll be wrapped up with hearings or however things deliberate, and maybe do a part two or something to them if depending on what is occurred. Okay, in the interest of time, um, basically we need a long term strategy. It can't just be. Over time, submit an amended budget, but this is not a long term strategy. You need to have new hires. Construction code officials need to be looped in. That's a strategy. It can't just be like I'm in the boiler room of the Titanic trying to get the water out. Like, OK, yeah. uh, with that motion to adjourn. Thank you. OK, motion to adjourn at 345 PM. Motion made by Councilperson Saleh. Second by Councilperson Ridley. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. We are finished at 3.45 p.m. Thank you very much.
I knew. Yeah, I did. I'm gonna. I'll send you over any revisions by tonight. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Twice. You too. I know. I remember. Who's the? Good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Thursday, the first day of June 2023.
This is a budget hearing for the Department of Recreation and Youth Development with the City of Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 3.30 p.m. start. The clock on my cell phone is showing 3.52 p.m. May we have a roll call for the commencement of this budget hearing? So, Councilperson Ridley? Here. Councilperson Prinzeri? Here. Councilperson Baggiano? Here. Councilperson Soleil? Here. Councilperson Solomon? Here. Councilperson DeGees? Council President Waterman? We have seven council members in attendance at 3.52 p.m. In addition, at this time of its preparation, the notice of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, May 26, 2023 at 3.10 p.m. to the Municipal Council, Mayor, Business Administrator, Corporation Council, and the local newspapers, so I can certify as to our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. I will now turn it over to our Council President, who is now going to be Chair for this, count, uh, for this budget hearing. Good afternoon. Uh, Director, could you introduce, uh, have your staff introduce themselves, starting with you? No, you can pass it. They can, they can speak for themselves. Can't hear you. Uh, on the side. All right, I see a green light. Definitely on. Uh, I am Lucinda McLaughlin, Department Director for the Department of Recreation and Youth Development. Oh, yeah. Good. good afternoon. I'm Donna Ward, Fiscal Officer for Recreation and Youth Development. Good afternoon. I'm Division Director of Parks, James Jackson. Good afternoon. I'm Elian Peralta. I'm the Assistant Fiscal for Recreation. Good afternoon. Keith Donath, uh, Division Director in Richmond. Jasmine Nunez, I oversee aquatics. Kyle Greaves, Finance Department. Danny Bates, not finance. Jonathan Gomez, Mayor's Office. Sunda. Yes, Councilman. It's all right. Can I say something? I have to leave for another meeting, so I got to ask you a question. I was stopped by a senior yesterday, and I remember this going back. I think it was before you came as head of the Department of Recreation. We used to have a lot of senior events up at the uh, Urgent Field. I think uh, I th they did some dancing, they did stuff. And they've all been taken out of there. And I understand this woman said that they were up at uh, further up in the north uh, at one of the senior centers. I want some of them back in Persian Field because that whole area around Ward C and D over there is filled with seniors. And, it's, uh, you know, I thought some of them were put back. But evidently, they never were put back. And as I said, I think this was done before you ever came. Councilman, I can certainly speak with the Division of um, Senior Services within Health and Human Services and see if we can get some of their instructed programs to take place at the Pershing Community Center. I don't see why that would be such a heavy ask, and I will certainly make that inquiry. All right, please. Director, start your presentation. Thank you, Council President. Um, council, we are here today to go over um, our ask to council members for um, our budget for the 2023 uh, year with the Department of Recreation and Youth Development. Uh, we do a lot of things at the Department of Recreation and Youth Development. Um, I think you are all pretty much familiar, but we're going to run right through. Um, so what is our mission? Our mission is to empower our youth to contribute in our diverse community and beyond. Our vision is that all children, youth, and young adults are thriving and productive, creating diverse and successful communities, irrespective of race, ethnicity, income, sexual orientation, or ability. Um, our, we have three divisions. Uh, Enrichment is responsible for providing quality professional recreational services and programs for our athletic and active residents, while encouraging each and every resident to stay fit, relieve stress, and become further acclimated within their surrounding community by way of recreation. Um, the Division of Recreation is where all of our aquatics are housed. Um, th th that division is responsible for providing a safe environment for swimming and recreation at all of our pools, the skating rink, including lessons and aquatic specific maintenance. A Division of Parks Maintenance is responsible for performing general maintenance operations at city parks and related facilities, supporting all cultural affairs events held in parks, coordinating and supporting the Jersey City Parks Coalition, identifying and performing improvements where feasible, um, and interfacing with other city agencies regarding parks projects. Um, 
So where are we on to page three? Uh, when we look at our budget, um, our budget uh, amount this year of $8,477,114, to the best of my recollection, is a either an 11 or 14% reduction of our overall budget last year. Um, in terms of employee headcounts, we have 79 uh, full-time employees and 80 part-time permanent employees. To be fair, I wasn't sure the protocol if like a vacancy position should be counted there. So I did err on the side of including those positions. So ultimately we we have like six less bodies right now because those are vacancies included in that headcount. Hmm. Uh, when we move to our, the, the next table is fairly straightforward. We already talked about the three um, divisions that we have within the department. I'm pleased to say that aquatics is now uh, officially a division with the recreation title and that we have an aquatics division director in Rosemary Nunez, which is a long time coming um, and an appropriate uh, an appropriate acknowledgement of the work and the management and the leadership that Rosemary is putting in every day um, at aquatics. Uh, so when we look at our director's office, it's it's light. Uh, it's me and an admin and a uh, recreation program coordinator. And then when necessary, we have a deputy director. It's not a position we thought was necessary to fill full time. Uh, but when and if that need arises, should I be out of the office? Um, Keith Donath, uh, our division director for uh, enrichment, serves as deputy director. Uh, next, we have our tables for each of our divisions. I'm not sure, Council President, if you want me to run through all of them, but just in general organization, we start at the top with our division directors. Any management that we have below, um, our managers are really working on uh, managing our vendor relationships for the most part. Our managers are not managing our union employees. We have um, Jersey City Supervisors Association employees who then supervise our 245 employees. So our, our field workers are um, all unioned and um, supervised in, in that manner by another union employee up the chain. Uh, so we have here, we have sort of some pods when it comes to programming and enrichment. So we've got our communications is how we communicate what, what's going on, whether in written form, social media, the um, our website. Phone calls, those are very important. We get a lot of them at recreation. Um, we look at our programming, uh, then we have sort of three pods of staff uh, for all of our numerous activities. Um, we also then have our community and professional development where we um, house all of our summer employment um, is important because the summer employee doesn't just come here to work for us for a hot, they come to us for, for about six weeks with professional development that is part and parcel of their training. We work on financial literacy. Yeah. We look at uh, first aid training, things that are important to the work and also important to the summer employment experience for our youth. Uh, in parks maintenance, we have a division director. Similarly, we have um, two management employees there who are overseeing all of our vendor relationships, which to the best of my recollection, are about $3 million worth of services that uh, we are utilizing and uh, now we have dedicated oversight through our managers uh, for those vendors. Uh, we then break into uh, two sort of, we have three general supervisors and there we have athletic fields covered, our general parks covered, uh, and we have operations seven days a week. We've got staff from 8 a.m. to uh, 11 p.m. now that we've rejigged some of our schedules so that we are, we are covered almost 24 seven across the park system. Um, aquatics on page eight might look a little uh, different when you just look at the way it's set up, but it's set up differently because we operate one pool year round and then our operations swell considerably uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, um, at which time we need to bring on uh, tons of seasonal employees. Um, so there we have that the top box is our core employees, our permanent employees all year round. Um, and then we have these pods for different seasons below, which give an example um, and insight as to how we add staff and, and what it is they're doing. When we move, uh, keep moving on. Now this page, to be fair, page nine is slightly redundant from the initial because uh, what do we do? We, we do the topics that I just laid forward with each of our divisions, um, but ultimately the director's office is oversight for our fiscal administrative transportation needs of the entire department. Um, in enrichment, not only do we have our programming, um, but our programming is not just to get a kid to show up, but it's programming that we're really focusing on the entire approach, right? From beginning to end, what are we accomplishing with the program? What is our, how is our staff interacting? Because it is very important 
um, that we want kids to continue to show up. We want parents to continue to bring children to programs. We've had really great attendance rates the past few weeks, or the past few months, excuse me. Um, and we ultimately want to make sure that everything's accessible. So what we have done this year within programming is we've added support staff. So all of our athletic programming is fully accessible to individuals with special needs. Um, the Division of Enrichment is also responsible for the management, permitting, and coordination of our athletic fields and facilities um, to promote responsible access to all community members. We are very excited. We will get later on, but we are rolling out a new field permitting system that is an online platform. It's really going to change the way the public views our fields and understands how they can be utilized for various activities. Uh, in recreation, again, that's where all of our aquatics are housed. That Division is responsible for everything we do pretty much at the Pershing Pool, Pavonia Pool, uh, Johnston Pool, also called Lafayette, the Pershing Community Center and the rink um, and the armory when we uh, lease it for uh, about a three month period of time in the winter. Uh, the division is also responsible for the management, permitting and coordination of the pools in the skating rink, including swim and skate classes and leagues. Again, uh, reasonable, uh, responsible access. We have a lot of teams and schools that need access to swimming lanes, need access to ice, and we deal with all those permitting um, opportunities in-house as well with the Division of Recreation. Then when we get to parks, we are responsible for year-round daily upkeep of all of our active and passive park areas, which includes playgrounds, courts, splash pads, uh, utility grass, which is regular grass that we walk on, um, athletic fields, anything that's turfed. Um, as well as those recreational facilities that are managed by our department, including the field houses at nine of the um, athletic uh, sites, the pools and the rink. And uh, again, I noted before the division of parks uh, really is a 24 hour operation because everything that's happening in a park um, that's put on cultural affairs or the city or nonprofits, they generate garbage, they generate people, and we are the ones that clean up and make sure the park is uh, safe and sanitary for park users moving forward. So we've, we've done a lot of stuff in the past year and it's sort of a, a little mixed on here, but um, what do we do? Well, we continue to engage our youth in recreational athletic opportunities and more than 11,000 youth were enrolled in direct programming last year. We hosted our first International Water Safety Day at Pershing Field Pool um, in collaboration or in partnership, I guess I'd say, with a statewide move by the New Jersey Recreation and Parks Association for water safety. And it was um, really a good job by the aquatic staff. Um, our junior Pee Wee Jets, which is our tackle football program, won the counties, uh, which was really exciting. Um, and our players have been invited to several clinics with the professionals, um, like on the Giants and the Jets because we're now more visible due to the success of our tackle football program. We've introduced coding classes, safe sitter trainings, and youth mental health first aid trainings to supplement our non-athletic offerings as well. And we're bringing back yoga this summer too. And we have also, as I noted before, added support staff so all programming is accessible to our youth with special needs. Uh, we have also made some site and facility improvements through a partnership with the Division of Community Development using some dollars that had been um, unallocated, we've been able, I submit, to make some really meaningful and uh, important uh, upgrades and improvements to things that were not prioritized by other areas of the city and were beyond our means and spark maintenance. So we're excited about that. And we've been working closely with architecture and infrastructure to prioritize um, projects that impact our facilities and our programming, including the return of the ice rink for hopefully winter of 2023. Um, we introduced Said this winter. Sorry. You go. That's that's the hope, Councilman. We've okay. been working yeah. hard, especially with the Assemblywoman, to, to obtain financing so that we're not trying to put the cart before the horse and spend money that we don't have. Uh, so we've been very successful, I submit, so far uh, securing some dollars, and hopefully the next step is going to be a bid put out publicly. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, we have an adaptive programming special needs social club. We started that last year. We actually first were running it out of the Collier Center, Senior Center. Um, it wasn't the best fit for our operations, so we rehoused ourselves over at the Pershing Field Community Center, and the attendance has been much more significant since then. Um, we switch it up every week, and it's a really nice opportunity. Um, and really, that uh, social club um, was a jump off from uh, just the success of our special needs programming in general, and the addition of a staff member dedicated in that area has really upped the ante for our city when it comes to engagement with special needs youth. 
Where is it located? I couldn't hear it. At Pershing Field Community okay. Center, Councilwoman, on Tuesdays. If you okay. Stop by. Um, we have also um, made great efforts to increase and um, identify vendors who might instruct programs that are outside the sort of ken or ability of our staff. And by doing that, we've been able to expand our offerings and even improve um, the skill set of the kids participating in our programs where we might be limited on a clinic perspective. We are now able to introduce kids into, you know, advanced tennis, perhaps through an instructor that has a program that's continuing outside of recreation. So we've found great success there. And I, I hope that we will continue that because it's, uh, it, it's working. Um, Regarding the uh, Office of um, Adaptive Learning and the Special Needs Programming, I believe the cutoff age is at 21, correct? 24. 24. Is there a way to increase that or is there a plan to have something for anyone that's over 24? So Councilman, the reason that the, the ages, if you will, for our department go to 24 is because when we did the reorganization, um, traditionally the, the youth age goes up to age 24, which is where that sort of cap came from um, on our program offerings. That being said, on a special needs perspective, I believe the Public school programming only goes up to age 21 for special needs. I and mean, we certainly have been um, trying to brainstorm ways to expand. Perhaps we, I, I don't want to make promises that we can't deliver on, but we have discussed, is there a way for us to um, maybe start offering a Special Olympics program for older youth who have aged out of mm -hmm. the public school programming at age 21, but still want to be active and involved. So perhaps in like a bowling or a basketball perspective, some sports that are already active in the public school program. So we're looking at uh, that to see if it is feasible for us to do. Because I, I personally don't agree that 24 is like uh, the appropriate age to cut them off. And even if you look at health care, like people don't get cut off from their parents' health care until 26. So I, you know, I would definitely uh, request if you could look into that and see if we could increase the age or have some sort of um, increase in activities because I, I know for my sister, she's going to be 24 and then um, she isn't of that mental age though. And, you know, probably she's younger, like 10 or 11. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Councilman, I, I hope that our um, all of our offerings and engagement with our special needs population have been responsive to what we see as a need. So I see Division Director Donna taking notes over there, and I'm fairly positive we'll be looking even more into it um, from an actionable perspective. And the programming is very lovely, by the way. Thank so you. That's why it's a benefit to the community. And as um, already known to all the council people, we have had a successful introduction of entrance fees for adults at Pavonia and Lafayette pools and programming fees to better sustain staffing and offerings through a direct income stream. So I will be before you before the end of the year seeking to have those fees put into a dedicated um, fund that we will be able to use. I haven't done it yet though. Um, we have um, continued to improve our communications regarding our departmental offerings, um, increased use of social media. We're I think we're making much better use of rec desk. We're using the email communications. We have staff presence at community events and in the parks. Um, and as I mentioned before, we will um, be doing a soft rollout, I believe next week of our online uh, field scheduling platform, which I think is very impressive and everyone's gonna be pleased with it. Um, we have also gained national and, rec and regional recognition um, as a city and as a department in the field of recreation and youth development. Um, we, this year, uh, the New Jersey Recreation and Parks Association awarded us the Jackie Stanley Excellence in Therapeutic Programming, which was the only state, um, you know, we're the only entity in the state to receive an award of like that. Um, we also, at the conference this year, were able to present our bucket drumming program so that other entities across the state can bring a similar program. And we already know that Old Bridge um, has introduced bucket drumming following our programming. They now have an active bucket drumming program for their seniors, uh, which could be an interesting thing here in the city. And we uh, also um, are active with the National Recreation and Parks Association uh, and the New Jersey um, organization in both the aquatic sections and cultural diversity. So we are um, leading in those areas for the city um, on behalf of the city, I guess I would say. Uh, we have also improved our parks maintenance operations. We have digitized our daily on-site inspections. Uh, so we have data immediately available to us. We are um, we have 
uh, been able to rebuild some of our pitchers mounds and ident and obtain practice pitching mounds, which is really important for our baseball community, both on the youth level and high school and collegiate. Um, so those things have, have been a while coming and um, have been greatly received. Uh, we have several splash pad upgrades um, about to be underway. There's one more I'll be in front of you next Wednesday regarding uh, Virginia Avenue. Uh, we have made repairs to various park safety surfaces, which is the soft you know, sort of matting underneath the ground. Um, that takes a lot longer to set up than it might sound. Uh, and we, I'm excited that we're doing it because, again, those are not things that have always been prioritized by um, architecture or engineering, who's usually building the new stuff. We don't build new stuff. We try to maintain the stuff that's there. And some of our um, amenities are not maintainable in their current condition. So we are lucky that uh, the DCD reached out to us and we were able to forge a strong partnership and address a lot of these issues. And we have also, as I noted before, adjusted our staff schedules to best meet the needs of mm -hmm. the community. We are uh, just hope, hope, hope a few days away from adding full-time staff that will cover the weekends. And so we have moved away from the overtime need on weekends by adding in two labor positions for that span Wednesday to Sunday. So that's Director, yes. let's start with your budget changes. Let's let's go there because I see a lot of red. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so so then you have some pictures of our stuff. So, Council yeah. President, are you? I'm going to go to the page that you're looking at. Some of the things look very red because what we have done is we moved all of our staff members into the actual areas where they operate. So by by us by purposely identifying the division of recreation in the aquatic realm. We were able to move all of the um, sort of sports and recreation aides who offer programming under the umbrella of programming. So that's why enrichment looks a lot larger um, people wise, but really what we have now is a visual that matches our operations completely. So our employees are properly titled. They are properly within the supervisory chain of command for what they are doing and how they are doing it. Um, so I submit that when you see something that looks really big and red, like on page 22, when you see recreation and it says salaries, well, last year, you know, we, we asked for 1.5, but now we're only asking for 700,000. It's not that we have less people, it's that, or less of a need, it's that those, those people are actually properly housed now under enrichment. So you'll see a large increase there, but it's really just a redistribution of what we already have going on. Um, so would you characterize it as level, fun, like let's say if you zoom out and look at the forest um, from the trees and is it same amount of funding from last year, less funding, like where, what's the? We have sought, uh, we are asking for a little bit less funding than last year. Um, in some avenues we were able to, we were able to identify some areas where we, put a larger number in the budget, but then we did not expend and and had not planned to expend the full amount. Um, an example might be um, like our small tools. We have a, a contract that went out to bid a few years ago on the purchase of small tools and sort of things that you need daily. And at that juncture, which was before me, but Duncan Hardware um, gave the most favorable bid that the city opted into. But that bid says if we buy every single thing in that contract, we would expend like $193,000 in a year. So before there used to be $193,000 in line 312 or whichever, 210, excuse me, and it would be the full amount, but we never expended $193,000 in small tools. So now we asked for like $40,000 because that's what we actually spend instead of trying to put the full number in here. So there are some, you know, we did what we were asked to do. We looked at our budget really closely. We identified areas where we maybe were asking for something that we didn't truly need. And so we identified all of those areas and have moved up on it. Um, what, what has increased between last year and this year is some of the wages that we pay our staff because we had trouble um, maintaining lifeguards, maintaining supervisors of basin pools, maintaining uh, supervising lifeguards because there's not a big enough pay discrepancy between the roles. So we are having trouble attracting our own employees to move up into more challenging roles because they don't think the money difference is worth it. So what I am asking you for on the last page is um, some, some changes in, in that regard. Um, but Council President, I submit when you see the red, and I can certainly go through each line if that's the most helpful, but ultimately um, 
it's not it's as the councilman um, Saleh pointed out it, it's 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 not really more or less it's pretty much the same and just now put in exactly where we need it uh, to appropriately reflect our operations when it comes to enrichment and programming recreation and aquatics and parks maintenance. Um, some things that we did, um, I, I do have an ask on page 28. I do have some changes that are requested in our introduced budget um, because of, to be honest, our own oversight in the budget process. I hope there's no one else. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't like saying that, but it is the truth. Um, in the Parks Division in line 215, we need to add $11,625 for uniforms. Um, we in, in enrichment and recreation had not been um, buying uniforms for 245 or JCSA employees because we weren't operating the same way. But now that we have parks maintenance under our budget, we have to do those things because those employees wear a standard uniform each day. And uh, to be honest, when we looked at the budget for last year, it had $11,000 in line 215. And with all the back and forth trying to determine how much money we needed, I think we just assumed that we had written down $11,000 for 2023, but we did not. So we, we do need those monies there because we are um, obligated by contract to uh, provide uniforms for our employees and we'd like to give them uniforms that align with our department um, rather than the DPW uniform. So they'll be coming off the DPW uniform um, and onto ours. Those uniforms that um, they wear, the DPW uniforms, they get, there's a washing service that we have that does that. So. Are they going to be washing it themselves? And if so, are we reducing our contract with the washing service as a result? So while I can't speak for DPW, all of our employees will be coming off of DPW's contract with Cintas. DPW does handle, to my understanding, handles their uniforms with a rental system. So they rent the uniforms from Cintas and part of that rental includes cleaning and maintenance. Um, the contracts for 245 and the JCSA employees, which are the two unions that are um, that uh, impact our department. The contracts don't require anything like dry cleaning or self cleaning. The contract actually requires us to pay our employees a certain amount for clothing maintenance. It requires us to pay them a lump sum so that they maintain their equipment. It requires us to provide a certain number of shirts and pants and a jacket like every two years for certain things and every three years for something else. It doesn't require us to provide daily, to provide twice as much as asked for. So we are going to be abiding by the contract and purchasing these uniforms. So this 11,625 this year will not repeat next year, but for a smaller amount that we will ask to hold there for new employees when they come in so that they can be similarly uniformed. But we are going to follow the contract um, directly, which provides, which requires provision of a certain number of tops, a certain number of bottoms and a jacket every three years. Um, it, Those belong to the city. Let's say they get laid off or leave. I don't want like renegade, you know, people wearing city city uh, uniforms. Like, so know. we we have written up a policy that does speak to the return of uniforms within a you know if within a certain amount of time should you leave service with the city. Okay. Liability. Okay. <laughs> Um, and additionally, um, we have we are requesting money for training in all of our divisions because, again, to be honest, when I believe it was two years ago when we were informed as departments that training dollars would or training would all be handled by HR, our assumption was that HR then was dealing with the budgetary side of training. And so here we are this year now being told, oh, you don't have any money for training because you didn't put it in your budget, but we thought we weren't supposed to put it in the budget because it was handled by HR. So um, we certainly need to make sure that we have employees who are um, up to date, uh, credentialed where they need to be, and those things cost money. And we also want to continue to increase the skill set of our staff. So we are asking for an additional $10,000 for training in, in line 307 for each of the three divisions. Um, in the recreation division, um, somehow uh, overtime was not included there. Uh, so we are asking for 44,000 for overtime. The only overtime only is a strong word, but um, recreation again is our aquatic um, operations and we have stopped over the past few years operating our indoor pools, indoor pool, excuse me, or the rink on holidays to avoid paying out triple time just because that's the day. But at our outdoor pools, the whole point of the outdoor pool is that it's open during the summer. So we do incur um, a considerable 
full amount on those holiday days, Memorial Day, Labor Day, July 4th, um, and any anywhere that it might be observed in between, um, we do incur overtime costs because of the way the, um, well, because it's work on a holiday and, and that matters. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how that did not make it onto the budget, but we um, we are seeking 44,000 overtime for aquatics to make sure that you all don't receive as many phone calls as we do, should we not be open on July 4th. Uh, director, this might be connected, but I received a uh, resident concern regarding the use of the ice rink for the T-ball players it, um, that they weren't allowed to use it anymore. That's is is this a result of the overtime? What is what's the reason behind that? Never been able to use it, Councilman. It rained the other day and suddenly the Pony League said, oh, well, we're just going to operate inside in the in the ice rink since you're since it's not operating right now. And we said, no, you're not. Um, that's first of all, not set up for baseball activity, not for bats or baseballs or whatever else. Um, but most importantly, when we do operate the rink, there's an, a mechanism built into the city uh, ordinances with regards to rental of the facility and costs and insurance requirements, which we utilize with hockey, te hockey teams and, and, and others. So um, that has that is not something that has traditionally been done. And for, it was last weekend when it was raining and we did say, no, you cannot move an entire baseball league inside because it's not something that we have ever allowed anybody to do. If they went through the proper procedures, would that be something that's allowed or is it not outfitted for that? Like what's the what's the take on that? If a group wanted to come to us and, and ask to rent the facility for a rate of $150 an hour, should they be 51% uh, Jersey City residents? Or I believe it's whichever way it is, um, but that's how we operate the rink. We don't just hand out the rink to individuals who want to meet there. Okay, and regarding the overtime, uh, do you have staff there that monitors? Is that like considered overtime if they do rent it out or? Yes, if uh, when rentals are um, in place at the rink, we have a security guard on site at those times. Okay. Who's paying the overtime at that point? What's the question, Council? Who's President? paying the overtime at that point? If a person, uh, organization from the outside want to rent anything from us, uh, so they well, pay the overtime or we have to pay it. Well, ultimately, the question is, if it was like on a holiday, would we have somebody there, right? So who's paying the overtime? It's, it's always us. Um, we don't have a mechanism to pass on additional costs to constituents um, right now. So like on a on the 4th of July, everyone's paid overtime because it's 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 the holiday, right? If the 4th of July falls on a Tuesday, on a Sunday and the observed day is Monday, then both Sunday and Monday are triple time pay by way by virtue of the contracts. Is that double pay for July 4th or was that like? I mean, it's actually double pay on a holiday. It's triple pay on the observed holiday day. Oof. So it's, Freedom there's a lot of dancing that has to be done to fully answer that question, Councilman. Um, but the answer, Council President, is that those are costs that are borne uh, by us. Thank us, you. Us as a city. About overtime. Are they over their budget yet in the overtime? Finance. <laughs> I mean, well, I, be I believe this request was missed for the recreation division and we are exploring um, the correct amendment to fund it to make sure that they have enough overtime for the year. But um, I believe they are just about at what they asked for a year or they're on pace to not exceed it, including this um, 40,000. But there are additional part-time wages and seasonal wages that we can easily use to cover this uh, just due to the the lag in hiring or you know we, we budget part-time seasonals for I believe 20 hours a week if if they're doing 18 17 hours naturally money is returned to the budget that could cover the overtime and that's kind of the way we've addressed recreation over the last few years and it's, it's worked out um, the director has been pretty spot on with their budget as far as transparency and staying on target. So it's not a concern for the finance department right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then I asked for the overtime and in line 102, this might be, it might sound a little odd, but I have three employees who are in line 102 um, by the name of Daniela Salazar, um, Julio Carollo, and Neil Patel who have been separated, but I still have monies in the budget for them. I would like to 
zero out their monies in the budget. And I would like to use those funds to redistribute to address what I noted before, which is challenges we are having with our um, higher supervisory staff so I can increase their hourly wages so that they want to stay and work for us and continue the work that they are doing. Um, so you notice there's a line that's um, blacked out because uh, basically by zeroing out those three amounts, it will be redistributed to our supervisors of baths and pools, our permanent supervisors of baths and pools, and our supervising lifeguards, including a vacancy position that we have for a, super, for a supervisor uh, lifeguard position that nobody in our ranks will even entertain taking, um, quite honestly, because the amount of money in the budget couldn't even hire a lifeguard. Well, um, finance, so based on what the director is explaining with these three salaries, um, that wouldn't be a problem or? Well, any proposed changes to personnel and salaries would typically go through the administration and human resources and finance would confirm the funding is available. So that's where we, we'd come into play here. Um, it's not an issue for us to redistribute. Um, amongst positions. It just has to go through the, you know, the proper channels. And the bottom number, council, council president, council members, and Kyle, the bottom number is exactly the same. We are not um, literally for the, the every dollar and cents that I'm asking us to cancel out from those three individuals. That is the exact amount in the annual picture that I'm asking to redistribute to, to the permanent employees in those two titles. Um, and then again, we have the training um, here for line 307. Uh, and then in enrichment, we have already included in enrichment $5,000, which we do in-house training for our summer seasonal employees. But we have an ask there for an additional $10,000 for training for the rest of our staff, again, which was our oversight with the assumption that another area of the city was um, putting together those finances and, and taking care of that. What are they training them on? And this is for the summer program, you're saying? Uh, What's well, for everything. So we already had $5,000 in the budget, which was in the recommended budget from the administration regarding the training for our summer staff. So there we have to do things like, you know, safe food handling, first aid training, uh, whatever else we, we bring in for that. Um, and then on the, we have a lot of training for, um, yeah, we have CPOs, our certified pool operators need to get training, and that's a requirement. Our pool managers are required training by under the first, under Red Cross, correct? Under the state, excuse me, under the state. Um, our lifeguard certifications need to be kept current, obviously. Um, we do child abuse training for all of our staff to be on the lookout for what are you looking for. We recently did training on um, reporting of, of suspected child abuse and the anonymity that can be involved there because our job is to keep kids safe, right? Um, uh, we also have things like attending the Nash, the New Jersey Recreation and um, Parks Association Conference, which is really important for us as a city. And we learn new things, we meet new vendors, we find better prices on things that we didn't know. Um, and so all of those things matter. Uh, we had some of our park staff today at a training on spotted lanternfly um, eradication. We are trying to bring, well, we, once we get some money, hopefully we want to bring someone in to um, help train up our staff in parks on, you know, some, some of the landscaping things that we could, we could use some tips on. Um, we've been doing in-house training even on like our own driving in parks maintenance. We've been practicing parking with the trailers and the different equipment. So you were drive by cave in sometime. You'll see a lot, a lot going on. Now the food for the camps, does that come through your budget or is that health or human services? Um, the summer food is, I believe, housed in, in health and human services, but it is not something that is um, that the my department has oversight for. All right, I'll save that later. Kids, how many, um, how many children enroll with the summer camp? Summer camp, we're probably around, we're lower than we wanted to be, Council President, to be honest. I think we're probably around 150. Um, summer camps in general across the city are seeing a uh, a lack of, a, of enrollment. Um, I 
expect because the public schools have worked really hard to introduce their own summer camp program with a before care aspect and an after care aspect. Also, the public schools are introducing that now. They sure are. So they are operating um, this called Sparks, which is all um, STEAM oriented. So um, Division Director Donath and I have been doing a lot of brainstorming because while summer camp is obviously important to the families that need to use it, what is also very important to our city is the summer employment program. And we want to make sure that we have meaningful employment opportunities for the young people who want to work for us for the summer because we don't want to not have work opportunities. So we're already brainstorming how we how we sort of correct that course moving forward, maybe connections with NJCU who no longer is financially stable enough to offer their own summer camp. Perhaps we could partner up with them. We've talked about um, approaching the, the Board of Education and seeing if there's a way that we can partner with them with a program they're already running. Um, so we're, we are trying to be creative, but if, if any of you guys have kids or um, are familiar, you know, I'm sure you're receiving all the same emails as, as I am as a mom about like, oh, but you can still register. We still have space. We still have this. So there is, I think for the first time, there's almost too many opportunities for kids in Jersey City this summer, which is a good thing, yeah. a good issue. Um, and we then need to, we need to determine how, what's best, right? How do we best serve and where is the need? So we're also contemplating and learning from our peers through connections with the New Jersey Recreation Parks Association and the National Association, how we might conduct a needs assessment to really identify um, what are the needs of our community from a public recreational perspective um, so that we can adapt to them. How many students did we hire? How many young people did we hire for the summer so far? Since, since we have a decline, are we, how many um, children are we hiring? I believe on the aquatic side, we have a, 127 um, summer seasonals and on the enrichment side that one's bigger because we not only have camp we have sports offerings we also house from an employment perspective the summer mural the youth mural program um, cultural affairs brings on some people to support their events in the summer communications brings on some folks so there's a lot of numbers there and i i just did the the whole chart, so I'm embarrassed that I don't know because I hope you enjoyed that extensive Excel spreadsheet the other day. We know, um, but I went through it. So I think on the I think on the camp side, it's just shy of three. Not camp, but on the enrichment side, it's just shy of like 300 or two 260 something is in my head. Go ahead. Oh, the report cards. I couldn't hear you. So what the division director is saying is when report cards come out, we find out which youth are actually not available to summer for the summer because they have to go to summer school instead. So we have some natural attrition with folks who, you know, we expect to come to work and then they do not come to work. We also have drop offs during the course of the summer with some folks who, you know, come out and then realize after it could be a day, it could be a few weeks that, you know, they they had summer plans they forgot about or they had vacation they planned about. So we do experience some natural attrition as well. Um, do the Board of Ed, do they charge for their summer camp? I, I'm just curious. So the Board of Education summer program, their summer, it's called Sparks. Uh, they do not have a fee for the, I think, 8.30 to 12 o'clock academic portion, but then they do charge, uh, I think, for Casper Aftercare is $400 for the month. And that would then, you know, the, the, the kids would move right from the Sparks um, sure. academic program in the same building into the aftercare program, which is how Casper operates now in the schools. Yes, Carl. Enrichment program, they've hired 119 people so far. For enrichment, yeah. There are quite a few vacancies that I believe we're in the process of onboarding for, though. 119 onboarded so far. Question for the um, summer camp. When is the last day to register? Register until you if, you, if a kid shows up and we have space, we can get them registered. Okay, because you said we, we probably will have maybe about 150 kids, right? For summer camp. We already have, so we can, we can, we can accommodate more um, for sure. Okay. So if the $25,000 gift that we have, right, we're only using that for low and moderate income families. So let's say we have 200 kids in summer camp, they're not all going to be low and moderate income, right? So there should right. be a little money left over. I'm not saying it's a whole lot, but um, 
can we then, I guess, maybe this is a question for Kyle, can we then take some of those funds and maybe apply it to some of this training that Lucinda's asking for? We're going to support any professional development that the department needs. We do budget a small contingency for things directors may miss um, that are absolute requirements. Okay. So any professional development that um, recreation is going to need, we will just we'll coordinate with uh, human resources on making sure that those are all you know properly noted. So when the requests do go to the human resource department, they know to approve it. But and if I may, Councilwoman, ultimately your question is, so there was a donation of $25,000 that um, the Councilwoman Woman Ridley as Councilwoman for Ward A had discretion to allocate where it, the need was identified this year, which was identified for camp. So should we not utilize all of those monies to um, scholarship a low to moderate income youth for a, fa a session, then we should be able to, in the same vein, use those whatever leftover monies there are to pay for some of the training that we want to do for the staff. Is that, I think that's what the council. Wants. Yeah, I'm just trying to find a way for us to not have to, I guess, search for additional funds within the budget. Like, I mean, like I said, it's not going to be a whole lot to help with this list of things you need, but. I think every little bit counts. You're absolutely right. And we um, similarly have a very extensive Excel spreadsheet with regards to the donation and the scholarship um, youth. So I can certainly let you know where we are on the yeah. financials there. What money is. It's 50 cents left over. That's 50 cents that can be allocated somewhere else, to yeah. be perfectly honest. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. If you can provide the council with a, uh, you know, a list of how many kids and where the funding went, like a breakdown Excel spreadsheet. Absolutely. And have a free day of pool. <laughs> Get to go to the pool. <laughs> Do we have um, turfed up fields around Jersey City, and are we monetizing them? Are we renting them out? Like, what's what's the take on the maintenance turfed up fields versus uh, grass fields? Uh, well, there are different maintenance. There's different things that we have to do there. We have four locations that are turfed out in Jersey City. Um, actually, just today, we had the turf maintenance vendor on site to perform one of the three um, tri-annual deep cleans. So it's a very timely question, Councilman, but we have turf fields at Martucci, at Haven Point. There are two, technically three, baseball, football, um, soccer. Uh, Gateway is a regulation soccer that is turfed, and I'm... Blanking right and Berry Lane, excuse me, is another um, regulation soccer size turf. Uh, so right now, our ordinances do not provide any way to monetize our field rentals, um, whether they're made of artificial turf or made of grass. Um, I submit that we have not only um, academic, you know, we not only have youth schools and, and groups who are using these fields, we have professional entities that cross the river to come use our turf fields because we don't charge any money for them. That's great. Um, I just perfect answer that I was looking for. I also wanted to turf up Pershing Field and, you know, there's a lot of people that want to play soccer, cricket, and um, it's definitely a good source of revenue. So if you have any idea as to how much, you know, a turfed up field use would be, um, would love to coordinate with your office and the rest of my council colleagues to come up with a plan to um, leverage our assets in this city. Been researching it for years, Councilman. I'm happy to share out how other entities are doing it, how our neighboring cities um, are, you know, um, bringing in some dollars to help with their maintenance costs and their um, ownership of various facilities. Uh, we certainly have a really extensive group of, of athletic fields and facilities in our city more so most people come in and say they can't even believe all the things we have you know we got 21 splash pads that is that is not comparable anywhere else uh, that that i'm aware of um I you know, doing it. we have 21 we have 26 excuse me athletic fields we, we have all that <laughs> on. so there certainly is an opportunity perhaps to identify like a for-profit organization if we only if we as a city only wanted to you know, think about ask for contributions from one sort of group, perhaps a for profit entity might be the right way to look. But I'm happy to sit down and share the mountains of research that we've been looking at for a while. 
Um, it's just a really challenging topic to sort of unwind because our schools, um, not just our public schools, but our private schools, our colleges, everybody uses our fields. Um, private entities that charge kids, charge participation, they use the fields. Uh, we have, again, colleges, we have brand new schools who never even had a sports program, who just establish a sports program and then say, where's my field? Um, we've got Zog Sports, we've got entities that are willing to pay, we just don't have any mechanism to charge them. Yep, and I know there's a lot of people that want to use those courts, and right now, at least in the Heights, it's just a geese area. So um, definitely want to leverage that. Um, is there a way to, I'm going to, I was going to ask something, like a municipal ID, do you have like a, a take on a municipal ID in terms of like reservation system for rec department or um, have you spoken to IT about this? Is this anything in your field of dreams? Um, well, a municipal ID is certainly in the field of dreams for the health department. Um, Director Flanagan has been um, fairly vocal about the benefits that a municipal ID would have for the health department's operations. Um, and again, coincidentally, Councilman, we are on the same page on a lot of things. I was just writing an email yesterday about how uh, if there was a municipal ID program in the city, it would be very beneficial, like at the pools, it would be a lot easier. We could have a like a shorter line, you know, if you're used flash your ID, then we know you're a resident and, and it's, or we scan it and, and it's done. Um, so there certainly are benefits, would be benefits to a program like that. Um, in full disclosure, it is not something that we are trying to figure out how to how to handle, manage, roll out, pay for. That's not something that um, this table on the left of me is trying to determine, but we would certainly um, want a seat at the table. It would be a great benefit, especially in such a diverse community like we have where not everybody has a license, not everybody has a valid ID. Um, some people aren't entitled to licenses, right? So um, it we would certainly um, share the benefits and our operations could benefit um, and accountability could benefit from a municipal ID program. The municipal ID program was discussed a number of times over the years, including in conversation with the Immigrant Affairs Commission. So before we go down that road, we really need to have a, a, a different conversation about that because there are there are some unintended consequences of doing that and there might be a better way to do it not with a municipal id but maybe in conjunction with the library or something else along those lines but we but yeah i can i can debrief you on conversations that go back to 2018 and 2019. Mm -hmm. i just see like we got the library system we got the parks and rec and then you have um let's say dog parks or dog runs where people don't have their vaccinated dog, uh, you know, sent to the health department. There's so many things, even if it was an application and, you know, it doesn't have to have all the private information, but something. Well, you recall also with the library conversation is he was trying to get library cards to all the children in the public school systems. They have privacy issues there, so it's, it's worth a conversation, but but there there might be better ways to do it outside of a municipal ID. Absolutely. Yeah. Or we could also partner with the county because the county has a county ID that they do give out to residents that do not have driver's licenses or a state ID. Okay. So, so options. worth exploring. Questions? I guess we won. So just on the question for parks, um, can you guys sort of Ellen, your capacity right now on tree trimming and you know what, what's in this budget and what other kind of budget requests might from that. So Councilman, the only trees that our park maintenance um, uh, workers touch are trees that are in our parks and we only deal with a, basically a limb that's like eye level or below. If it's, eye, if it's above our eye level, we call the forester so that we can't be accused of doing improper <laughs> things with trees to be perfect. So we don't um, we don't touch street trees. And um, when we have a dangerous condition or something like that, as noted on our inspection sheets or as called in, we enlist the foresters. So in our budget specifically, we're not, you know, renting scissor lifts. We're not um, we don't I think we own one chainsaw in all of parks. 
we do have some pole saws, right? So for the smaller things that we need to be able to reach, but we um, do not have any of the equipment or manpower for tree trimming specifically. Great, thank you. Okay. I, oh, go ahead, I'm not done. What's the? Oh, no, I, uh, I have a question. I was just saying if you had another question to TF. I just, um. so then to that point, I know we've talked about this, and Danny, so um, we've had line items in DPW in the past for tree maintenance. <laughs> So that would still be with DPW within the forestry and not and nothing would have transferred over to the parks, correct? Okay, thank you. What is the spotted lantern fly strategy for our parks? You going in there with the flamethrower? Like, what are we doing, James? Come on. <laughs> well, Councilman, I can only tell you that the training was today from 9 to 12. So other than seeing the certificates for our three supervisors that attended, um, I don't know what happened at the training. So, uh, and James was not there because he was um, overseeing one of our vendors because the manager was at the training. So we'll can tell you tomorrow what the, what the, plan is, but ultimately I know last year when it came to like spraying for lanternflies, that was something that was um, solely their responsibility or even the opportunity for the county. It's not something that we as a city um, even had the right to do, nor do we have the proper um, certifications that would be necessary for a chemical application like that. Okay. Questions? No? There. Motion. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn at 4.47 p.m. Made by Councilperson Saleh, seconded by Councilperson, Councilperson Ridley. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. We are finished here at 4.47 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Think out on all my school year grant. Oh, wow. Oh, sorry. Oh, you and gotta be tired. French like weeks now, and like thinking about what happened this year, what are the goals for next year? So now looking at these numbers, I'm like, oh, no. Drink.